myself. I got a guy sitting there with headphones on going through every channel, and we're not finding it. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But it, you guys can hear it. I mean, I can. Did you hear anything? Did anyone else? <laughs> I, I was doing
months ago when Duncan and I chose the sermon topic, Love and Courage, Even When You Want a Chicken Out, we had no idea what would be going on in our country or our world or how much we would want to chicken out. So we're glad to have you with us to help bring some love and courage into this room. Before we sing the song, Woke Up This Morning, it seems appropriate that we um, actually wake up. Some of us are morning people, and uh, some of us aren't. <laughs> but let's wake up not only in body but in spirit, as in the Black Lives Matter hashtag, stay woke. As when the activists of different eras have woke up in the morning with their minds stayed on freedom. And because in the last week we have been inundated with pictures of adult violence, we think it is especially important to reclaim the innocence of childhood. There is a custom at the mountain summer camp at morning circles where someone will yell out, have you got the spirit? And the answer is, oh yeah. So let me ask you, have you got the spirit? Oh yeah! Have you got the spirit? Oh, oh yeah. yeah! This morning, we're going to talk about the spirit in the broadest possible terms. So as we begin worship, let me invite you to reflect on a time in your life when you felt spirit, camp spirit, or team spirit, or school spirit, or the Holy Spirit. <laughs> In many of our congregations, we say love is the spirit of this church. So let's gather in the spirit of love and begin this worship with this question. Have you got the spirit? Oh, yeah! Come, let us worship together. Please rise in body and rise in spirit. Wake up your voices and join us in singing. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was staying, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stay, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stay, stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I was singing, I was singing, praying with my mind. And it would stay, stayed on freedom Singing and praying with my mind And it would stay, stayed on freedom Singing and praying with my mind And it would stay, stayed on freedom Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah I can't hate, I can't hate your neighbor in your mind If you keep it stayed on freedom Can't hate your neighbor in your mind If you keep it stay Stay on freedom Can't keep your neighbor in your mind If you keep it stay On freedom Hallelujah 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 Oh I woke up this Oh I woke up this morning with my mind And it was stay Woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed, stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Y'all look good. <laughs> I 
I decided to use love and courage as a signature on my correspondence because I wanted to put something at the end of my emails, letters, um, Facebook responses that was a challenge and a wish, but not too serpy. And my boss at the time was Reggie Williams of the National Task Force on AIDS Prevention, and he had already taken yours in the struggle, so I couldn't use that. I wanted something honest and powerful. And the good part of that was the love piece because I really believe that love is the most powerful force in nature and humanity. And it better be. Back then, my life was a big adventure, and we were trying to do something about HIV and AIDS. And it took courage and it took love for us to do all that we were trying to do. And Maya Angelou said, without courage, it seems love won't much matter. Back at home in Georgia, there's a state senator, you may have heard of him, Senator Josh McCoon, who is pushing for a fourth time, which means his, he's been defeated three times, in passing a religious freedom and restoration bill. And he was pushing this discrimination through the legislature as we were gaining momentum toward freedom to marry. My first job after ordination was as the faith outreach consultant for Georgia Equality and the National Freedom to Marry movement. My job was to, in our language, be in conversation with Senator McCoon. <laughs> what I helped Georgia Equality and Freedom to Marry do was put together press events and other things with clergy who were opposed to bigotry and oppression that was ensconced in the bill. I wanted diverse faith leaders to speak truth about being against the bill and also, if possible, support freedom to marry. The bill, if you're familiar with them or if you're not, it allows folks to opt out of respecting the, the rights and privileges that come with marriage for same-sex couples based on their own religious beliefs. After three years of trying to get this passed, they've added new folks into the mix of discrimination. This past year, the Georgia State Legislature came back with no less than nine bills, some of whom wanted to take women's right to being in charge of their own health care way. So they were broadening who they wanted to discriminate against based on their religious beliefs. As a Unitarian Universalist, I knew many of my fellow beloved colleagues and clergy members supported us. Of course we did. We even relied on them to be at the events. Friends from the Atlanta cluster, the Mid-South District, or the former Mid-South District, and the Southern Region. But my job wasn't to organize Unitarian Universalist ministers. My job was to get those ministers who, many of them in their pulpits, couldn't support us but who could speak against the discrimination. And some of them didn't agree with us on every issue. What happened in that work was transformational for me because 
something spirit-filled transpired as I made the calls to many diverse faith leaders. And I got more courageous as I made those calls. And I found support for us in places I never imagined. Now, one not so surprising, but really touched me was when an African-American lesbian pastor brought her almost entire congregation to a Valentine's Day rally against the bill and for marriage equality. She had about 150 African-Americans at a pro-gay marriage rally. What changed the tide, though, was we had rabbis in the Atlanta area come forth to speak against the discrimination in the RIFRA, or the Religious Freedom and Restoration Bills. And one of those rabbis was from a conservative synagogue way out in the suburbs. He couldn't stand with us on everything, but he recognized discrimination when he saw it. What I'm saying this morning is love the work, but be courageous in extending our arms to people who do not believe some of the things we do. Keep your hands out there. Let spirit work. Let some of the pain of our past, and unfortunately, some of the pain of our current work and grief be the fuel to go where we have never imagined going. We are at the crossroads of history again, faced with tragedy and opportunity. Unitarian Universalists are uniquely capable of grabbing diverse people of faith by the hand and sharing with them in the healing and sharing the, the stories with them. We are with them much more powerful. Spirit makes us bigger. Spirit makes us better. Lizzie, I'm not really a morning person. What about you? Um, I am, yeah. Well, in that case, this is for all of you who also aren't morning people. We're gonna lead an energizer. And it's, it's one that some of you may be familiar with. It's often used at high school camps and conferences and in high school youth groups. But if you're not familiar with it, don't worry. We're going to help you along. I'm gonna take this side of the room. And I'm going to take this side of the room. And the words go like this. We've got spirit, yes we do. We've got spirit, how about you? Are you ready? We've got spirit, yes we do. We've got spirit, how about you? We've got spirit, yes we do. We've got spirit, how about you? I'm not sure you're all awake yet. You certainly don't sound it, so I want to hear it louder. We've got spirit, yes we do. We've got spirit, how about you? Oh, I know we can do better than that. We've got spirit. We do! We've got spirit! How about you? I'm not sure. I still think we can do better. We've got spirit! Yes, we do! We've got spirit! How about you? Oh, even louder! We've got spirit! Yes, we do! We've got spirit! How about you? I know, I know. We have got the spirit and I think that you're giving your all, but I think we can get louder, but how can we do that, Kim? Um, you know what? 
what if, what if we did it together? Oh. We've, We've got, got spirit. spirit. Yes, yes, we, we do. do. We've got Have you got the spirit? Oh, yeah! <laughs> when the Protestant reformer Martin Luther was a young man, he used to write out his sermons word for word and get up in the pulpit and read his sermons word for word to his congregation. And then one day a person came up to him and said, Martin Luther, that's no way to preach a sermon. What you need to do is simply go up into the pulpit and let the Spirit speak through you. He said, I did that once. I got up in the pulpit and I heard the Spirit say, Martin Luther, you should have prepared a sermon. I like to think that the Spirit speaks through spontaneity, but also preparedness. And this morning, we've erred on the side of preparedness. But at other times, spontaneous action is what is required. During the civil rights movement of the 60s, there were times when work needed to be done on short notice. A story was published in Ebony Magazine at that time about a young student at a northern university who was in his dorm room late at night when all of a sudden the room was filled with light and a deep booming voice said, Verily, I say unto you, I want you to go to Mississippi and work for civil rights, and lo, I will be with you as far as Memphis. Friends, it takes courage to answer the call of the Spirit. The call might not come with big, bright lights or in a deep, booming voice. Indeed, the call may simply be the impulse to do the right thing without the noise of words or the flash of special effects. In 1998, I answered the call and was ordained into the ministry here in the heartland by the Hopedale Unitarian Universalists in Oxford, Ohio in Kumler Chapel, which is where the civil rights workers of Freedom Summer gathered to sing freedom songs before going down to Mississippi. Three of those young people would not return, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney. I carry with me a deep sense that I was ordained on holy ground in a place and by a congregation where the Spirit breathes. Even so, I was not prepared for everything the work of the Spirit could bring into our lives. I currently serve the Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church, and when the search committee asked me why I wanted to be their minister, I said, because this is a brave congregation. In 2008, that bravery was required of us when a man walked into our sanctuary to commit a hate crime, having written a manifesto filled with sexism, bigotry, homophobia, and racism. He walked into the doors, opened fires, killing two wonderful people, Greg McKendry and Linda Crager, injuring eight others and traumatizing us all. There is no simple way to summarize our experience. But when I am called to do so, I will sometimes quote an anonymous comment that was written on our local newspaper, the Knoxville News Sentinel's website. Someone wrote, I get the impression that if I were to walk into the Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church with the intention of doing someone harm, they would put me down on the ground, take my name, and add me to the prayer list. But we know thoughts and prayers are not enough. On Sunday, June 12th, we all woke up to the tragic news of the shooting in Orlando and the incomprehensible body count. 
On that morning, our congregation sang the anthem, We Shall Overcome, with special emphasis on a verse that has special meaning to us, We Are Not Afraid. But let's be honest, when we sing that verse, we are often lying to ourselves. When we sing that verse, we often are afraid, but it is a fear that gives way to fearlessness. It is a fear that is the foundation of courage. Sadly, these heartbreaking experiences have become all too common. Last year, when General Assembly was in Portland, my congregation and I were at the Bethel AME Church in Knoxville, where we were grieving and healing from the violent shooting of the Charleston Nine. And while a Black Lives Revolution resolution was being debated in the assembly in Portland, we were organizing to respond to a rash of church burnings in the South, one of which happened in our own community. And when I showed up at the door to respond as a first responder to that, who should I meet at the door but David Hayes, a local organizer of Black Lives Matters. The work we do here has ramifications at home, so let's take the work home. I was at the General Assembly in Indianapolis in 1996 when our denomination became the first denomination to go on record for legal marriage equality in our country. And when General Assembly was in Portland, Oregon, our congregation was hosting the first legal same-sex marriage in the history of our city. My friends, the decisions we make in this room have ramifications far and wide, but we must remember to ground our work in the work of the Spirit because we've had some bitter debates in these assemblies. We've had some general assemblies where there has been acrimony and ill will. Earlier we sang, we, we engaged in the chant, we've got spirit. Yes, we do. But our challenge is to see the spirit on the other side of the aisle, to see the spirit on the other side of an argument, to see the spirit on the other side of the arena at the other microphone. In politics, we are divided. In opinions, we may be split in two, but in the spirit, we are one. The poet Mary Oliver once wrote, the spirit likes to dress like this, 10 fingers, wiggle fingers, 10 toes, wiggle toes, shoulders, and all the rest. But I'd like to offer a friendly amendment because I've seen the Spirit dress up in bodies where we do not all have the same body parts. We do not all have the same number. And while some of us stand on the side of love, I've seen the Spirit move in a wheelchair and in a scooter. So let's keep moving together on the side of love. There is no way we can be prepared for everything life can throw at us, and there is no way that one person or one congregation can act bravely and boldly for every good cause. For instance, in the history of our denomination, this General Assembly has passed more statements of conscience, so many it would make one person's head explode. That's why we need each other. That's why we can't go it alone. We are better together. We can't do everything, but we can do something, and we can choose to make the something we do a brave thing. So let me ask again, have you got the Spirit? Oh, yeah! Have you got the Spirit? Oh, yeah! Then prepared or unprepared, ready or not, here we come. got to do what the Spirit says do. You've got to do what the Spirit says do. When the Spirit says do, you've got to do. Oh Lord, you got to do when the Spirit says do.
got to do when the Spirit says You gotta sing when the Spirit says sing When the Spirit says sing You gotta sing, oh Lord You gotta sing when the Spirit says faith we give thanks for the blessings of a world community as we share our common dream homes and schools where children thrive neighborhoods that are safe and clean a city rich in colors and cultures an economy where no one is expendable a beloved community where rich and poor alike have access to the opportunity for a dignified and productive life. Churches, mosques, synagogues, and temples where our deepest hopes is to be of service to a hurting world. Enable us as we leave this place to carry forth this prayer into the coming week. Turning our thoughts toward charity. Our hearts toward justice. And our hands toward the work of peace. Shalom. And amen. Gotta do when the spirit says do. You gotta do when the spirit says do. When the spirit says do, you gotta do, oh Lord. You gotta do when the spirit says do. Spirit says do. Spirit says do. Spirit says do. Spirit says do.
Good morning, friends. I now call to order the third general session of the 55th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Well, you got energized in the uh, worship half hour. Do you have energy for me? All right. Just a curiosity, how many folks are here from Ohio? Have you packed the hall? Yes, you have. Glad you're here. How's the uh, fourth day? of GA, how's your energy level? How is your, um, really? That's good, that's good. The sleep deprivation quotient, how's that working for you? Getting enough sleep? Where are the youth? You apparently got enough sleep or you just didn't even bother to get any to be here this morning, is that right? All right. Um, before we get started with a report from our Right Relationship team, um, let's pause for a moment and remember the uh, 23 people in West Virginia who died in these awful floods. Um, I grew up in southwestern Virginia, very close to where this tragedy occurred, and drove through West Virginia on my way here. Um, so let's just take a moment to think about these 23 people uh, ravaged by these floods. Thank you for that. I'd now like to bring back Lisa Bobby Kemper to give us a report on right relationships. Good morning. Here we are on Saturday, and I hope you are all having a good General Assembly experience so far. I spoke yesterday about the importance of having compassion and staying connected when we are discussing issues about which there are strong and differing opinions. Our covenant is relational, and we want to remind each member of this gathered community that there are real people who represent each abstract issue we face here this week. Each of these people has different needs and different experiences. Our many identities intersect and interact, and justice for one group may feel or be oppressive to another. This is inevitable, and it is the primary challenge of a community like ours, which speaks of radical welcome. Please take this to heart today and tomorrow, and be kind to one another. We are each ambassadors of our faith, not only outside of the Unitarian Universalist world, but we are ambassadors to each other. And as such, our actions should always represent that radical welcome. 
As always, I invite you to look for our orange bandanas and orange t-shirts if you need help working through staying in covenant together. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. As things happen during our General Assemblies, we've had a little kerfuffle. You know that word, kerfuffle. Um, we've had a kerfuffle on the actions of immediate witness in terms of what was on the sheet. So they are being reprinted to, uh, for it to be correct so that you can then vote. So we're not going to vote uh, on that as quickly as I had hoped. But since we have such an adaptable group of presenters and participants, I'm inviting Rob Eller Isaacs back to tell you about the Distinguished Service Award. Friends, as Secretary of the Unitarian Universalist Association, it is my distinct privilege to convene the board committee charged to propose a recipient for the annual award for distinguished service to the cause of Unitarian Universalism. The award is presented each year to honor one who has made extraordinary contributions in helping to strengthen Unitarian Universalist institutions while deepening the impact of our ministry. This year, the Unitarian Universalist Board of Trustees is honored to celebrate the exemplary service of the Reverend Dr. Laurel Hallman. Here to read the citation and introduce Dr. Hallman is her successor as senior minister at the First Unitarian Church of Dallas, Texas, the Reverend Dr. Daniel Cantor. We start with the words of Laurel Hallman from her 2003 Berry Street essay. She said, we need a language of reverence. We need a language of forgiveness. We need a language of reconciliation, a language of hope, a language that gives voice to despair. To name a few, that language for centuries and countless cultures have been metaphorical. It has pointed beyond itself to something much deeper than it could name. It is our turn to keep such language alive hold it in our hearts and speak to the depths of those who so desperately need our good word. The Reverend Dr. Laurel Elizabeth Hallman, preacher, pastor, leader, grandmother, visionary, teacher, guide, and friend for 50 years, you have ministered to UU congregations, colleagues, and communities in so many cherished ways. Builder of congregations, UU institutions and leaders, spirituality and friendships. You have brought a vision of the larger truth and a keen wisdom to everything you have done. Born in San Francisco and raised as a fundamentalist Baptist, so serious about your faith you carried your Bible in your books to high school. You learned to cultivate a spirit of soulful contemplation in that faith and purposeful intent to grow a faith. In the 1960s, you prepared to be an elementary school teacher, majoring in music and social sciences. When you moved to St. Paul, Minnesota, you became a Quaker, and then a friend introduced you to Unity Unitarian Church. In the 1970s, you were part of their curriculum design team, building the Images for Our Lives curriculum, using values clarification matched with stories from many faith traditions. You came to the ministry through church administration and this religious education work and entered the theological training at Meadville Lombard in 1977, a divorced single parent and deeply experienced in Unitarian Universalism. Before receiving your MDiv from the University of Chicago Divinity School and your demon from Meadville, you were a chaplain in San Francisco 
and the John B. Wolf Preaching Scholar in Tulsa. Ordained at Unity Unitarian, you were first called to the Unitarian Church in Bloomington, Indiana in 1981, and then in 1987 became the first female senior minister of a large church at First Unitarian in Dallas. That's, it. That's right, the family starts that. You led both churches to new levels of professionalism, generosity, and spiritual depth. Throughout your career, you have pioneered your place, often in all male settings where clergy gathered. With dynamic preaching and worship, a high quality of religious education programming, and by helping both members and guests connect to the church in meaningful ways, First Unitarian Church of Dallas doubled to more than 1,000 members and in 2005 was named one of the first UUA breakthrough congregations. In your justice work in Dallas, you connected with Ernesto Cortez of the Industrial Area Foundations and helped build trust across faith barriers. You have mentored a generation of ministerial interns, trained countless board members, and addressed financial stewardship as a spiritual practice. In the 1990s, you brought Carver policy governance into being at First Church in Dallas, a visionary example of many to many large UU churches. Your work to develop and make available a unique spiritual practice for UUs through your Living by Heart program with your mentor, Harry Schofield, has a lasting impact on us all. Your call for us to embrace diverse and spiritually driven language and worship and faith development sustains us and challenges us to live into being the faith we are called to be. Through your collaboration on the Whose Are We book and curriculum, we are further deepened to respond to theological questions of import. You remain grounded, cultivating your own deepening through continued education with the Shalem Institute for Spiritual Leadership. And your leadership contribution to the Meadville Lombard Theological School extends from being a student and active in the school's ministerial formation program and as a trustee and collaborator and as capital campaign chair. You have been a strong advocate of high standards, willing to take on the role of supervisor, both for students who showed great promise for the ministry and for those who had significant challenges. In 1997, you received an honorary doctorate of divinity degree from Meadville Lombard. In 2013, you became chair of Meadville Lombard's Pointing the Way campaign committee to strengthen the foundation of the school and initiate new educational programs. Small in stature, strong in spirit, you meet each challenge with courage and conviction. You have always understood yours was a higher purpose. And so your ministry included leadership in clergy retreats, the publishing of your book, Reaching Deeper, and coaching ministerial colleagues who needed your support and your guidance. Elegant and thoughtful, you model the highest standards of religious leadership in every role you undertake, from lay leader, church administrator, professional religious educator, curriculum developer, parish minister, senior minister, and executive of a large church, spiritual teacher, candidate for the UUA ministry, author, mentor, and trustee. Laurel, we must include poetry also because it has been your sustenance and your guide. Ask Me by William Stafford is a favorite of yours and goes like this. Sometime when the river is ice, ask me mistakes I have made. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. Others have come in their slow way into my thought and some have tried to help or to hurt Ask me what difference their strongest love and hate has made. I will listen to what you say. You and I can turn and look at the silent river and wait. We know the current is there, hidden, and there are comings and goings from miles away that hold the stillness exactly before us. What the river says, that is what I say. Reverend Dr. Laurel Holman. Your leadership, fellowship, vision, words, and wisdom are powerful expressions of the best our ministries can offer the world. We 
are honored to recognize you with the 2016 Award for Distinguished Service to the Cause of Unitarian Universalism. Thank you. Thank you, Rob Eller Isaacs and the committee. Thank you, Jim Key and Daniel Cantor. I am a bit overwhelmed. Like most of us involved in congregations and on, in our association, we do what seems to be needed and hope it's worthwhile. Jim Key's call to tell me I am this year's recipient of the Distinguished Service Award caused me for the first time to reflect on what I have done as a body of work, to think of the threads that have been constant in my ministry through the years, the religious literacy of children, the spiritual depths of our members, the strength of our institutions, generosity as a spiritual practice, inviting people in who need us, and community organizing to join forces with other groups to create change and promote justice. A long time ago, I adapted some questions from St. Ignatius for use in my spirituality classes and retreats as well as for my own practice. I found that ministry had so many demands coming from so many directions that it was easy to lose sight of who I was or what I thought what I thought I was doing. When I began to slip into going all directions at once, I would stop and begin the simple practice, who am I? Who else am I? I would insert the phrase, God be merciful, between my answers to who am I. You use in my retreats would sometimes be confounded by that additional phrase, but I would encourage them to just go with it. It almost always did its work, which had little to do with the thinly imagined mercy of a thinly imagined God and a lot to do with deep, metaphorical, religious imagination spanning centuries and real, present, spiritual depth. I have to admit that after Jim Key called with the news I was to receive this award, I was stunned and then driven back into my who am I practice. Ironically, I have been working with my spiritual director to enlarge my capacity to receive. <laughs> I was one of those children trained not to be prideful, which became a practice of discounting people when they told me I had been helpful. I've been working on being more receptive to heartfelt sentiments of appreciation. And then God's little trick, that would be a deep metaphorical trick, God's little trick on me was this award. My spiritual director laughed. <laughs> so here I am receiving the Distinguished Service Award from the faith tradition that saved my life so long ago when the religion of my childhood, my early worldview, failed me. A Distinguished Service Award for my ministry to congregations which opened their collective hearts and lives to me at a time when it seemed easier for congregations to choose men. I am receiving this award for all the gifts I have already received through the years. It is truly amazing. 
Early in my time at Unity Church Unitarian in St. Paul, Minnesota, working as an administrator and an RE director, I decided I wanted to preach. My great-grandfather had been a circuit rider preacher. Maybe it's in the genes. I began to preach in churches in the area which needed supply. One Sunday, waiting to preach at the First Universalist Church in Minneapolis, John Cummins said, When are you going to theological school? I answered that I had no plans for ministry. I had a young son to raise, and I was happy in my work as it was. He said, Well, when you do go, we have some scholarship money to help. <laughs> Let me know. Does this award take into account people like John Cummins, who planted the seeds? When I first started preaching, I discovered that because I am short, I couldn't see over the top of the pulpit in any UU churches. <laughs> the custodian in St. Paul, Phil Platt, built a riser that I could take with me when I went off to preach. I used it in Bloomington, Indiana, in my first called ministry. I took it with me to Dallas, where, because it was Dallas, they carpeted it, put molding around the corners. <laughs> and they added a small handle to make it easier to carry. In the meantime, back in Bloomington, a wonderful doctor in the community, Walt Owens, retired, and he took up woodworking. His first project was to build a new pulpit for the church. He built it with a fold-out step for anyone who might need it. <laughs> the year I preached the service of living tradition in Indianapolis, the good people in Bloomington put the pulpit in a truck drove it up to the convention center so I could preach from it. I was literally lifted up. I was literally lifted up by their love. I tell you this because if grace is ours according to our capacity to receive, I first have to answer the who am I question by acknowledging that I am here because grace has come to me in the form of congregations and on denominational task forces and committees who met me where I was, as I was, and blessed me with acceptance and love and support. Often that was literal support, not only step-ups into pulpits, but money and time for projects we undertook together. I cherish their memory. The night I lost the UUA presidential election, <laughs> I stepped up onto a table in a patio to talk with my closest supporters. I told them our message had been important and we had made a difference even though we had lost election, the election. When I paused for breath, Larry Ladd, who was standing next to the table, said, I won. I admit I was a bit startled, but in a way I won too. Larry and I were married that September. I've <laughs> I've done good work with Burton Carley for the UUMA, had time to be with my Austrian grandchildren, to do projects I've wanted to do for a long time and to enjoy life. I decided to formalize my retirement and walk in the service of the living tradition last June. In the fall, I announced my last sermon, preaching at First Unitarian Church in Dallas for the last time. And then in January, as a surprise even to myself, I accepted the invitation of the Falmouth UU Fellowship on Cape Cod to be their interim minister. So evidently, it's not over till it's over. <laughs> <laughs> the 
But here's the thing. Three weeks ago, I was visiting with a couple in the Falmouth congregation, pillars, we discovered in the course of our conversation that we all had roots in Minnesota. Avis Grossline said, my sister still lives there in the northwest part of the state, just over the border from Fargo, North Dakota. And then she added, she's a member of the Underwood Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I said, I preached at the Underwood Church in the 70s. They had no minister. They wanted someone to preach on Easter. So I would go with my young son in tow and preach for them. The next Sunday, Ava said, I wrote my sister. She remembers you. She said, they still have the riser they built for you. <laughs> My sister said, tell her to come back anytime. I just might do that. I'll show them this award for distinguished service to the cause of Unitarian Universalism. I'll tell them the part they had in making it possible. And I'll tell them about you here, bearing witness to our beloved faith. Thank you. This is an extraordinary day. I have such a great job to make those calls. Uh, you, you have no idea the, the joy this role brings me on occasions like this. And of course, when I get those tweets and texts in the morning before going on and suggesting how I might run today's program. <laughs> every day, every day. You're wonderful people. I thank you so much. I really do. I really do. <laughs> well, I think we have sorted out our AIW kerfuffle. You'll have to look that up. So I call on Susan Geckler, Chair of the Commission on Social Witness, to give us a report on the potential actions of immediate witness and an overview of the process for AIWs. Thank you. <clears throat> There were 11 AIWs that were proposed. Um, eight of those were submitted with sufficient signatures to be considered. Uh, the CSW has the task of lim narrowing that to six that you will be considering this morning. You received in your CSW alert this morning summary statements for six. Unfortunately, one of the summary statements was for a st one of the proposals that was not, um, did not make the cut. Um, I think one of the traits of being human is that we make mistakes. So I want to admit to you my humanness at this point. So what you will be looking at for proposed AIWC is not what is in your CSW alert, but instead is halt drone warfare. Because you have the descriptions of the others, the abstracts of the others in your handout, we have done the description for that one and we are projecting that for you. 
I will read it so that if people uh, do have visual problems, they will also be able to have access to that. So it says U.S. drone warfare has killed more than 7,142 people, most outside combat zones in a secret unaccountable process. Justice is denied to innocent victims, increasing suffering, anti-Americanism, and blowback. Senior religious leaders of denominations with statements on drone warfare meet White House officials on July 14th, and the UUA needs this AIW to send representation. The UUA should be there to urge an immediate halt to U.S. drone warfare, at least until the U.S. is transparent and accountable. In addition to the abstracts that you have printed and on the screen, you will hear from each of the proposers this morning before you vote, and Jim Key will explain the voting process. But let me explain a little bit. I've already had a question this morning. How are the decisions made? What should you consider? The criteria for an action of immediate witness is projected now. Something that requires immediate action, is specific and narrow, doesn't duplicate a recent AIW, is grounded in UU theology and practice, fits with the ability of congregations to take meaningful action, and present, presents a chance for you congregations to become respected participants in public dialogue. So as you are listening to the presentations, as you are looking at the abstracts, I encourage you to keep these criteria in mind in your decisions. This morning's vote will be to select three of these six to be placed on the final agenda for a vote tomorrow to adopt or not adopt. At the end of today's general session, you'll notice in the um, schedule, there is a vote to uh, place on the agenda. So what will happen is you will vote for three, we will count that, I will come back and report those, and I will then make a motion to officially add those three to the agenda for tomorrow's general session. So it won't be a second vote to select, it will just be a formal process because we have to do that to put something new on the agenda. So I hope that's clear in terms of process. So with that, I actually have something to say formally now. So the Commission on Social Witness submits the following six issues that meet the criteria for actions of immediate witness and have received the required number of delegate signatures. Delegates may select up to three to add to the final agenda for a vote on Sunday. Thank you, Susan. So now we're going to take the first step of the process for adopting actions of immediate witness. Bylaw section 4-16 provides that not more than three actions of immediate witness may be admitted to the agenda for possible final action, and that two-thirds of the delegates must support the admission of each one on the agenda. Delegates had an opportunity to pick up a copy of the proposed actions uh, and have seen the list here. If there's any delegate uh, uh, that needs more information, uh, someone from the Commission can uh, provide that. The following proposed actions, and let's show them on the screen, uh, yes, um, have qualified for possible admission to the final agenda. As you have heard from Susan, uh, AIWA builds solidarity with Muslims, B, some guns, all guns, legislating appropriate restrictions, C, halt drone wherefore, warfare, D, stop the TPP, E, support H.R. 40, the Commission to Study Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act, and F, stop the hate, protect and support our transgender brothers, sisters, and siblings. So we have six groups that have decided that there are some issues that the delegates need to consider. So it'll be up to you this morning, based on the rules, and 416, as I said, to narrow those down to three. Tomorrow, you will vote on the actual language of those. Today, you're just voting on whether these are the three topics that you feel are worthy and important enough that you want to spend some time on this afternoon in many assemblies and tomorrow in general session 
to see about actually making a statement as a delegate body. So here's the process. You've got the alert. You've had the corrections to that. Um, they're in random order. The letters that are there respond to the letters on your ballot at the bottom of your, the bottom stub, A, B, C, D, E, F. The statements themselves, the full statements, are at the CSW booth. They're not available now because you're not voting on the full statement. You're only voting on the topic. At the mini assemblies this afternoon in rooms E160, E161, and E162, you'll have an opportunity to look at the full statements and then make decisions on whether you want to revise the wordings on these. So before you vote, you're going to hear statements from each of the proponents of each of these AIWs. So I recognize the delegates, if you are at the pro microphone, yes. Excuse me, let me interrupt with a, a, a late breaking announcement, <laughs> as it were. This year, um, we're trying something new. Offsite delegates will be submitting typed statements online instead of calling into the hall. And these statements will be read by volunteers, uh, and they may or may not be used this morning. Kara Madrone from the UU Church of Greensboro, um, Phoebe Musman from Elliott Union Chapel in Kirkwood, Missouri, and Rachel, or is that Missouri? I don't know. Uh, and Rachel Nikes, Nikes from UU Congregation of Monmouth County, New Jersey. These are volunteers, and they're going to be the voice of our off-site delegates. And the statements they read do not necessarily reflect their own personal views. We have every intention of returning to full audio and even adding video in the future as the technology becomes easier to use and integrate into these sessions. So are we ready at the pro microphone? I we recognize are. the delegate at the pro microphone. Good morning. I'm Cindy Landrum, ministerial delegate from Clark Lake, Michigan. I'm here with Eric Huffer of Lexington, president of the Mid-America Board, the Reverend Don Cooley of Louisville, another member of the Mid-America Board, and the Reverend Catherine Burt of Lansing. We're here to ask you to vote for AIWA, Build Solidarity with Muslims. It's the only interfaith AIW at our interfaith GA. In December of last year, a Sufi imam and professor at the University of Detroit, Imam Salih, reached out to the Reverend Kimmy Regal of Southfield, Michigan, with whom he had worked before. He asked her to join with him and asked her to reach out to other UUs to combat Islamophobia and increase knowledge about Islam. Kimmy reached out to UUs in her area of Michigan and beyond to join Imam Salih to, in discussion about what we can do. He thought us uniquely positioned as Unitarian Universalists to reach out to Christians and the rest of the interfaith community because our congregations are already engaged in interfaith work. We decided to begin by creating a resolution asking UU congregations to engage with us in this work. We brought a resolution before our Mid-America Regional Assembly, adopted by 11 congregations um, to our Regional Assembly, which passed overwhelmingly. Thank you. Yes, I'm Eric Huffer from the uh, Universe, Unitarian Universalist Church of Lexington and also President of the Mid-America Are Board. you speaking to? I am, I am in conjunction. Okay. okay. Yes, it did pass overwhelmingly at our regional assembly. Two and a half weeks after the uh, regional assembly, we were able to uh, meet with Detroit area imams, present this resolution. Excuse me, and you're out of order. We only have one spokesperson per uh, statement, and I'm not sure whether were, you're using the first two minutes, but the clock has been reset to two. No, that's not our intent. Our intent was to share the two minutes. Are you going to wrap up the first two minutes then? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So to go back, it was passed overwhelmingly by our regional assembly. Two and a half weeks later, our board was able to meet with Detroit area imams, present this resolution, and engage in a over almost two hour uh, roundtable discussion about how to go further. I cannot stress enough how much impact this resolution had coming from our region and how much more it would have coming from our UUA. The imams repeatedly expressed their gratitude and how much it meant to have Unitarian Universalists standing in solidarity with them. This is an opportunity for partnership. Thank you very much. For AIWB, I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. I am Kim Holdridge and serve as a delegate from the First Unitarian Church of Orlando, Florida. Just two weeks ago, tragedy struck our city. 
The Pulse nightclub, a place of fun and acceptance, became a killing ground. Fortunately, our community is united. LGBTQ, Latinx, Muslim, all of us. We are receiving tremendous support from around the world, and we will make the long journey toward health and wholeness together. Unfortunately, the factors that led to this horror still remain. Some factors will take continuing reflection and conversation. There is so much more work to do in our country around mental health, hate rhetoric, and cultural violence. However, other factors can be addressed right now. We, as a liberal faith community, can act to ensure that no other community goes through the nightmare Orlando is now living. We can ensure responsible gun ownership that will keep uh, with laws that keep all guns out of the hands of some people and some guns out of the hands of all people. This is not an impossible dream. Just this week, the United States Supreme Court upheld assault weapon bans in Connecticut and New York. Other states have also passed this important legislation. Mass shooting uh, gets headlines. The sad truth is, in less publicized ways, guns claim 90 lives every single day across this nation. This is an epidemic. America does not have a gun problem. America has many gun problems. Enough is enough. When will be enough for you? Please support the AIW, some guns, all guns, legislating appropriate restrictions. We can and we must act now. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I now recognize the delegate at the pro microphone to talk about AIWC, Halt Drone Warfare. Hello. My name is Michael Landrum. I'm from the, uh, we are from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Rock Tavern, New York. We're here representing our minister, Reverend Chris Antal. Throughout history, the American military never fired the first shot. That proud tradition vanished when George W. Bush invaded Iraq preemptively and with false assumptions. Our continuing drone policy, also known as lethal UAVs, is an extension of that mindset and a large disappointment of the Obama administration. The moral ambiguity of these secret killings should be a clear call for a statement of conscience from Unitarian Universalists everywhere. In 2013, Obama created a task force at the Stimson Center asking for proposals and recommendations on the use of drones. Their report, issued in 2014, outlines eight concrete recommendations, including that U.S. drone concluding that U.S. drone policy should be transparent, accountable, and consistent with long-term U.S. national security goals. In 2016, Stimson issued a report card showing the administration's failure. Targeted killings of terrorists is one thing, but the blowback from unintended civilian killings in Pakistan and Yemen is a potent recruiting tool for terrorist organizations. We are calling for the immediate implementation of the Stimson Task Force recommendations. We have a real opportunity in just a few weeks. The White House has agreed to a meeting on July 14th on this topic with major religious leaders from all denominations. We feel it is vital to be, that we be represented there as well. We have learned that UUA President Peter Morales will be out of the country on that date, and therefore we are calling for the appointment of an ambassador for disarmament, peace, and security to speak truth to Thank power. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone to talk about AIWD, Stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I am Dick Burkhart, Church of the Larger Fellowship and co-chair of UUJEC. Well, what is the TPP? It's the corporate-driven and secretly negotiated trade and investment deal between the U.S. and 11 Pacific Rim nations, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And why is it so controversial that Bernie, Hillary, 
and Trump all oppose it. One reason is that NAFTA was a huge job and wage killer for U.S. workers. It hit Mexican farmers very hard, too. But the TPP is less about tariffs, more about domestic regulations. It gives a green light to speculators to continue many predatory financial practices. It extends patents to raise drug prices. U.S. manufacturing continues to take a big hit. And forget about democracy. The TPP was negotiated in secret with key sectors sidelined precisely because there was so much to hide. And its dispute resolution tribunals are designed to let foreign corporations attack U.S. laws that might reduce their profits, including labor, environmental, health, and safety rules. What can we do? First off, the plan is to bring the TPP to Congress after the November elections to bypass growing opposition. Second, Fast Track was passed last year, so it must be voted up or down. No amendments are allowed and little debate. Therefore, just tell your senators and representatives to vote no. This would force it back to the negotiating table. Then demand a transparent, inclusive, and collaborative process where the winners must compensate the losers in practice, not just in theory. In other words, democracy and equality, not corporatocracy. Thank you. Thank you. And now I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone to talk about supporting H.R. 40. My name is Lee Banner. I'm a delegate from the Unitarian Church of Evanston. Uh, Representative John Conyers has introduced House Resolution 40 every congressional session since 1989. The bill would establish a commission to study reparation proposals for African Americans. The study would address the lasting effects of slavery in our country, the physical and emotional terrorism suffered by the descendants of slaves, and their systematic economic deprivation abetted by government policies through much of the last century and until today. We think the time is right to gather enough public support to convince Congress to take this bill seriously and vote to fund the commission. A key component of H.R. 40 is education, to help Americans move toward a common memory. For example, it isn't widely understood how slave labor significantly contributed to the early economic growth of our nation, or how, more recently, black Americans have been locked out of benefits such as the GI Bill and the ability to grow financial assets through home ownership. Another purpose of the bill is reconciliation. The study will establish the moral justification for addressing the present consequences of these injustices. If reparations ultimately are enacted, they could take many forms such as job training linked to public works, affordable housing outside our ghettos, or an overhauling of our still segregated school systems. This isn't about inflicting guilt on white Americans. It's about truly understanding and owning our history. We propose that the General Assembly express support for H.R. 40 through this action of immediate witness and that all our congregations immediately help increase public awareness of the reasons for conducting this study. Thank you. And good timing. I now recognize the delegate at the pro microphone to talk about uh, AIWF, Stop the Hate. Good morning. My name is Angela Bridgman, UU Peace Fellowship, Raleigh, North Carolina. I stand here today with support from North Carolina and Tennessee and Massachusetts. This came about as a result of the passage of HB2, better known as the bathroom bill in North Carolina. I am 14 years post-op. I only got my birth certificate changed two weeks ago. If that hadn't been done, I would be being forced into men's restrooms today. In Massachusetts, people or transgender still have difficulty changing their birth certificates, and in Tennessee, it is legislatively impossible to do so. We saw in Orlando, and we saw yesterday with Westboro Baptist, 
the blunt hate, but the real hate LGBTIQ people face in our country is much more subtle and much more insidious. We have double the rate of unemployment, near universal harassment on the job. 90% of people in the 2011 U.S. trans study reported harassment on the job. 29% of those seeking emergency shelter were turned away. 42% of those who were allowed to stay in emergency shelter were forced into facilities designated for their wrong gender. And most shockingly, 12% of the respondents from the 2011 U.S. trans study reported discrimination or harassment from EMTs. These are the people that are supposed to help us and save our lives. And as a result of all this, as a result of HB2 in North Carolina, HB, 10, HB 1840 in Tennessee, HB 1523 in Mississippi, and over 200 past or pending legislations in state houses across this country that are anti-LGBT, 41% of transgender people have attempted suicide. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Having heard from the six proponent of these proposed AIWs, have you gotten an overview of these potential AIWs? Certainly they're all worthy. So now it's time to vote. Take out a pencil, a pen, a crayon, whatever you like to use, and select up to three that you would like to see move forward. If you do more than three, your ballot will be invalid. If you select one three times, there will be invalid. You can check just one or just two, but no more than three. Then you're going to tear this stub off ever so gently, ever so gently, and pass this to the uh, ushers that are traveling the hall here. Any questions? Can we pass those out now, collect those? I am uh, ready for our special collection. If I have our speaker for the special collection here, that would be useful. Uh, hold on just a moment. Let me check with my stage manager. Well, we are looking for our next presenter, uh, and we will uh, move along and hopefully find um, Kenny Wiley. If anybody knows where he is, please text him or ask him. Um, do we have him? Do we have him? There he is. Uh, this is where I should have a little uh, medley of tunes to uh, sing him on the platform. But it's important for him to do this because we have some special music to follow this special collection. So get out those envelopes and listen very closely to what Kenny has to say to us. So our special collection this year is to support Black Lives Unitarian Universalism, or BLUE. Here's Kenny Wiley to tell you about it. <laughs> it's exciting, so listen up. Good morning. Whew. All right. What's up, GA? That was that was terrifying moment. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm Kenny Wiley, and I serve Unitarian Universalism in a variety of capacities. 
I serve as a senior editor for UU World Magazine. I serve as the director of faith formation at Prairie UU Church near Denver, Colorado. I see you, Colorado. What's up? And as a lead organizer for the Black Lives of UU Organizing Collective. My Unitarian Universalist story is not unique, but statistically unusual. I am a third generation Black Unitarian Universalist. My black grandmother found UUism at a time when many black folks were leaving this faith. My parents married in the First Unitarian Church of Austin, Texas. My sisters and I grew up at Northwoods UU near Houston and did every, okay, what's up? And did every program, every UU program you can name. Our whole lives, coming of age, neighboring faiths, why are you you? I'm not sure if how you, you, are you is an internet quiz, but I gotta think I would score okay. <laughs> Every year, friends, on Christmas Eve at my home church down in Houston, a woman elder would read these words from 20th century Unitarian religious educator Sophia Lyon Foz, found in our hymnal. Each night a child is born is a holy night, a time for singing, a time for wondering, a time for worshiping. Each night a child is born is a holy night. Friends, those words are deeply embedded in my soul. Those words are my UU theology. Each night a child is born is a holy night. When Mike Brown was left in the Ferguson, Missouri streets, when Trayvon Martin was killed, those words came roaring back from my upbringing, my UU upbringing, and pushed me out into the Denver movement for black lives. And so when I think of Sandra Bland, when I think of Rakia Boyd, of Tamir Rice, John Crawford, and many others, too many others, and when I see media outlets or other folks suggesting that they deserved what they got, I come back to that saying, each night a child is born is a holy night. The night Sandra Bland, the night Rakia Boyd, the night Tamir Rice, the, day, the night or day they were born, those were holy nights and days, friends. The entire Black Lives of UU collective has deep roots in this beautiful, challenging faith of ours. For us, we don't just see our faith as part of the work of why we work to make Black Lives Matter. We believe that the work of Black Lives Matter is the work of Unitarian Universalism. If we are to be the faith that believes truly that the night or the morning or the day that we were born, that each of us was born, was a holy night, a holy morning, a holy day, then we've got more work to do. The UUA committed $60,000 from this morning's offering to the Black Lives of UU Collective. Because of this commitment from the UUA and the UUA board, we have been able to assist over 65 black UUs from 22 states who have who contacted us for assistance with registration, transportation, and housing costs. <laughs> Two-thirds of respondents have never been to GA before, and half would not have been able to attend GA without our support. So this is real, friends. This is real work. With your financial help this morning, we are excited to say that the grant will allow us to begin preparations for the first Black Lives of UU convening to be held in the Southern region in the first half of 2017.
A dozen black UUs attended the Movement for Black Lives convening in Cleveland last summer, joining over 1,200 black folks in justice work and conversation and community. We look forward to creating a similar explicitly black gathering, though probably smaller than 1,200, though you never know, for black UUs to connect and live into this world we dream of. As an organizing collective, we wrote the seven UU principles of black lives last fall. Our first principle states in part, we strive to promote and affirm black lives. We strive to promote and affirm queer black lives, to affirm trans black lives, to affirm formerly incarcerated black lives, to differently abled black lives, black women's lives, immigrant black lives, elderly black lives, children's black lives. Black lives matter. We throw no one under the bus. We rise together. We rise together, friends, and if you believe as we believe that all black lives matter, that the night each and every one of us was born was a holy night, a holy morning, a holy day, we ask you to join us. We ask you to financially give generously, to give abundantly. We ask you to help us meet that 60,000 goal. We ask you to take risks, to have the hard conversations, to proclaim without apology with words and with actions and with deeds and with funds and with love and with your hearts that black lives matter. And I ask you to say it with me now that black lives matter. 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 Thank you so much. Let's do this. We're not gonna sleep through this revolution, my friends. With leadership like that uh, and an ask like that, if you were gonna give X, I think you should stroke a check for two X. Or put a zero, a couple of zeros uh, behind whatever you were gonna throw into the plate. This is really, really important work. This is the center of what Unitarian Universalism should be about in the coming years. We've missed some opportunities in the past we're not going to miss them this time. While our ushers are collecting the offering, I want to acknowledge the over 30 congregations and groups that have pledged over $1,000, $1,000 or more, to this special collection. We start this $60,000 ask with over $30,000 received from the congregations that you'll see rolling on the screen. There's some great stories out there. I don't have time to share them with you. Many of these congregations uh, ask for a thousand from their budgets and people raise six and seven thousand. So there's a great deal of generosity and uh, enthusiasm for this, uh, to supporting this, this effort. So I encourage you to do so as well. And if you'd like to give online, you may text BLUE to 41444. That's how I did my donation. You'll get a response that asks you to click on a link that takes you to a donation page. Easy peasy. And now I want you to hear a special piece of music that works well for this offering, I think. And you can sort of understand my consternation when we couldn't get Kenny to the floor because they, they pair together very well. So welcome back, Sue Peck, and I think she's brought a few friends. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am Jan Chamberlain from St. Louis, Missouri. Since the tragic murder of Michael Brown, we at Elliott Unitarian Chapel have stood weekly vigil with our neighbors in Ferguson. We have a new song for you today, but it has a familiar melody. I'd like to share with you briefly how it came to be. My dear former colleague, the Reverend Michael Hannon, was a young man in the Unitarian Liberal Religious Youth Organization. In the 1950s, the executive director of LRY, Sam Wright, was inspired to write new words to the old tune of Finlandia. This became known as the LRY hymn. 
1993, when the UUA published our gray hymnal, Singing the Living Tradition, they adjusted just a few words of the LRY hymn and included it. And I think you'll agree it's become one of our all-time favorites. We would be one. Michael Hennon says, our faith is a living, growing thing to be written and rewritten when times, conditions, and new insights require it. As Elliott Unitarian Chapel has stood in solidarity with our neighbors in Ferguson, Michael Hennon was inspired to write new words for us to sing with the same power found in the music of We Would Be One. He asked for my assistance, and then, in honor of Michael's retirement last fall, I asked Cliff Harden to create a new choral arrangement. This song is called For Justice Now. Justice now. So 
Love the new words. Lovely. Imagine a healthy Unitarian Universalist community that is alive with transforming power, moving our communities and the world toward more love, justice, and peace. Those words are the preamble of our association's shared vision or global ends. They can be found in full on page 84 of your program book and also on the UUA website. I opened my report to you last year with the same phrase, and I've shared them with every congregation and community I have visited over the past year, 26 visits across 13 states. Imagine a healthy Unitarian Universalist community that is alive with transforming power, moving in our communities and the world towards more love, more justice, and more peace. Those words still animate my work for this liberal faith and inform my report to you on how your governance structure is responding to that vision. I've been reading Turning Point, essays on a new Unitarian Universalism edited by Fred Muir, the senior minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Annapolis. I strongly recommend it to anyone in this hall and beyond who cares for this faith, faith and wants it to remain a prophetic voice in the public square. Muir challenges us to acknowledge and correct our trinity of eras. He writes, fundamental to our survival is a paradigm shift, a frame bending that goes deep in the history and character of Unitarian Universalism, because it goes to the essence of how we understand ourselves and in turn relate to the world at large which means how do we relate in our demographic context. He continues, fundamental to our future is recognizing our way of faith from its leadership to its Sunday service to justice-making partnerships have been supported and nurtured by this trinity of eras, leading not only to ineffectiveness but also to an inability to share our liberating message. This is to say, while Unitarian Universalism's gospel is good news, it is losing its vitality and relevance. He defines the trinity of eras this way. One, we are held, being held back and stymied by persistent, pervasive, and disruptive commitment to individualism that misguides our ability to engage the changing times. We cling to a Unitarian Universalist exceptionalism that is often insulting to others and undermines our good news. We refuse to acknowledge and treat our allergy to authority and power, though all the symptoms compromise a healthy future. But Muir offers a trinity of promises that I want to speak to as an anecdote to our trinity of eras, generosity, pluralism, and imagination. And I want to report on these promises that the moderator and the UUA Board of Trustees are pursuing. Generosity, pluralism, imagination. First, generosity. It's no secret that costs are up and congregational fair giving to our association is down. You've heard about that this week. The Board of Trustees charged Larry Ladd, our financial advisor, until I think tonight or tomorrow night, to form a task force, collaborate with the stewardship and development staff and others, and then bring to the Board recommendations to imagine an APF approach that was not based on membership but a percentage of income. The Southern Region has been testing such an approach, and we have learned much from their pilot. The second of Muir's trinity of promises is pluralism. This General Assembly is a great example of our understanding of the power of pluralism. Consider our theme, Heartland, where faiths connect. Peter Morales has made multi-faith pluralism central to his presidency. Working with partners in our justice and anti-oppression work, as well as with progressive faith movements, many of whose leaders were here with us this week. He wrote in the summer edition of UU World, Unitarian Universalism has long been a multi-faith faith. As such, I believe we have a unique opportunity to bring faiths together and to lead a multi-faith movement. I agree with him. 
But we have to focus on pluralism in our congregations as well, specifically in how we practice our fifth principle, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. We've been urging congregations to send delegates to GA and consider underwriting their expense for many years. However, typically less than 40, 50 percent of our delegates, our congregations bother to send delegates, and fewer still offer financial support to attend. Our most recent data suggests 28 percent of delegates receive some financial support, but it is not typically substantive. As a result, our delegate body tends to be older, whiter, and privileged, who have the time and money to pay their own way. This apathy towards participating in the democratic process closes out an opportunity for con uh, congregations to consider youth, young adults, people of color, and economic fragility. Last year, the Board of Trustees voted, established a scholarship fund to attract an appropriately diverse body of delegates. The Saturday collection in last year's general session, along with gifts from the board and senior staff, matched by the Davidoff Fund, raised approximately $28,000 to support the participation of delegates at this General Assembly. And while I'm delighted, and while I'm delighted that we were able to award 87 scholarships, to support delegates, I was disappointed that we didn't hear from more congregations and those congregations that did, didn't support fully. The third part of Muir's <clears throat> Trinity of Promises is imagination. And I must confess, this third part of the Trinity is the one that most animates me. I have shared with many of you in various settings my personal story of having been diagnosed with stage four non-small cell lung cancer in 1999. The morbidity rates were grim. 5% of those so, so diagnosed might live for one year. Only 1% might live for five years. I quickly imagined that I'd be in the 1%. Several times a day during my 10 months of chemotherapy, I imagined little Pac-Man consuming those rapidly multiplying cancer cells. I envisioned the toxic brew of my carboplatin infusions melting away the diseased cells. Further, I imagined myself surrounded by Liz, my children, my grandson, friends, and my new UU community. I would gather them in my imagination at a beach on Pangor Laut. It's an island on the west coast of Malaysia where Liz and I had been privileged to holiday when we lived and worked in Asia. Imagining the healing provided by good science, amplified by the unconditional love of family and friends, was incredibly powerful. Every day for many years, I imagined my health restored. I still return to Pangar Laut in my imagination as I have a need. Friends, it was imagination that got me to the 1%. And I've lived to see my family grow from one grandson in 1999 to six grandchildren in 2016. I believe in the power, I believe in the power of imagination, visioning, and wishing to move Unitarian Universalism to a place of more love, more justice, and more peace. You do too, apparently. We have congregations move into actualizing the beloved community as a result of the Mosaic Makers Initiative, with many congregations and communities having tough conversations on race stemming from the beloved converse conversations curriculum. If you don't have it, get it. Moreover, district leaders are imagining other ways of shaping governance. Three districts in the Midwest consolidated into one region two years ago and eight districts in the South and Central Northeast have voted to dissolve and defer governance to the UUA. Trust, imagination. The four districts in New England have entered into an agreement to dissolve governance structures over time. All of this right-sizing of governance structure is freeing hundreds of folks for other ministries that are, that are bending the arc of the moral universe towards justice. The board is in an imagination mode as well. At my request, the board established a task force to reflect on how we might focus on covenant over membership. 
I asked the delegates last year to imagine, rather than signing the book, people entered and were welcomed into covenant that would be reviewed, renewed periodically. Imagine if congregations and communities entered and were welcomed into mutual covenant with the larger association that would be renewed periodically. You'll have a chance at this General Assembly today to share with that task force what that might look like. The chair of the Renewing the Covenant Task Force, the Reverend Dr. Susan Ritchie, uh, and her team have been considering what a network of UU networked communities might look like and how that network could energize our faith. Many of you will participate in our breakout groups today that I'll give you some details on later. The board is imagining through its committee working group how we might further streamline governance structures. We now have 13 committees of the board and six committees authorized and elected by you, the delegates. Do we need all of them all of the time? Are they all a good investment of our governance costs? Are they the right size? Should they have variable members as needed? Should they be elected or appointed? Do they advance our ends? Do they have a sunshine clause that requires reauthorizing from time to time? A covenant to be renewed, as it were. Can we imagine the Goldilocks just right committee structure for a religious movement of under 200,000 members? The board will bring some suggestions to you as early as New Orleans next year. Some committees have already one committee has already told us they should be dissolved. Some committees have already ad, uh, advised that they will bring bylaws next year to reduce the size of their committee. So we're on our way. I can imagine a different way of delegates for dele delegates to discern position on bylaws, business resolutions, and actions of immediate witness that allow time to learn together before any up or down votes are taken. We have some, modeled some ways of doing that discernment at this GA. We'll do more as we go forward. You and the congregations, you are the UUA, not the board or the staff. Participation in the democratic process is how you direct us to hack, act on your behalf between general assemblies. That is our covenant. That is our polity. But still, too few congregations participate and fewer still offer any financial support, as I said earlier. We must find ways for broader participation in the business of our association. I speak to this issue everywhere I go, but it's up to you. You must do this as leaders and bring this back to your congregations. One last observation. Reverend Gail Seavey, senior minister at First Unitarian Universalist in Nashville, delivered a powerful address at Minister Days in her Berry Street essay. She detailed graphically. She de <laughs> She detailed graphically our history of clergy sexual abuse and our institutional temerity over the decades to recognize, acknowledge and treat this cancer. We have not always treated complainants with the pastoral care that we should we've sometimes been more interested in institutional reputation. As a candidate, I supported an initiative from the Safety Net Organization, a social justice uh, committee at the first UU in Nashville, to work with the administration to improve processes, work with the MFC to update policies. All have been responsive, all are moving forward on that, and we've taken some action, much action on that. The board and I are currently working with Marie Fortune, a consultant in this area, to, to assess our webpage uh, directions and access. She's given us a report, and we'll begin to act on that after General Assembly. I close with this reflection, again from Fred Muir. Living as 21st century Unitarian Universalist means restoring a faith that is religious and spiritual covenantal and experiential, progressive and evangelical. From the trinity of promises, beloved community will be shaped and the future of our faith can deepen and grow again. May it be so. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, but as we are running a little bit behind, let me, with great humility <laughs> and appreciation, uh, I want to welcome Denise Rimes, your vice moderator, who will deliver the Board of Trustees report. Denise? Thanks, Jim, and I'll make my report short, what Jim said. <laughs> Let me take a few minutes to add a few things on behalf of the Board of Trustees. It's with great humility that I stand before you and represent the Board, having just come onto the Board in February as the result of a res the resignation of one of our uh, beloved colleagues. We have had a mar I have had a marvelous experience being uh, brought up to speed with all of the activities for the, from the board this year. The relationship of the board and the administration has evolved into one that is blessed with covenant, collaboration, and commitment. Last year's board reflected the growing pains of a smaller board and the ongoing impl implementation of policy governance. And while this past year has not been without its challenges, we're beginning to hit our stride with some clarity and real sense of purpose. As cultural and political issues take deeper and deeper root, our board adapts quickly to the changing needs within society and within our faith movement. We have a number of working groups who in between board meetings work to educate us and further the work that we have limited time to do when we're together. Our inclusion and empowerment working group assures that we keep our ears to the ground on issues that intersect with our values. In October, in our October 2015 board retreat, we had a conversation about our dedication and commitment to Black Lives Matter, we began to consider how our UUA and its member congregations might strengthen and expand our commitment to Black Lives Matter. For those of you that were here last year and were part of the AIW on Black Lives Matter, we had a very difficult conversation. We in the, in the board recalled and discussed our experience of that GA general session and that AIW, and we truly regret that the process in place, the limited time, and the racism that we are all still working to root out inflamed debate and frankly brought out the worst in many of us. People were hurt. Lines were drawn in the sand and old wounds were opened. We know this work is full of heartbreak and we must find the will and use our learning in order to do a better job. We've met with a number of groups and talked about how we make these linkages and we've gone even further based on the work of the Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group where we've engaged in uh, one another in intimate and inspiring conversations about prejudice against the trans community and what is required of us in response to all of the anti-trans legislation being proposed across our country. As Jim has told you and as others have told you, we're, we are working very hard to amplify generosity and stewardship both through our traditional channels and through our collaboration with staff. Moderator Key, as you just heard, as part of our effort to expand the circle of those able to come to General Assembly, established a scholarship fund, and we have a number of delegates who are able to join us this year as a result of that fund. And we're supporting with great enthusiasm the Generosity Network, where we'll help to build relationships with congregations to help them be more generous with the UUA. Something that you might not know, in January of this year, unless you're a uh, minutes geek, uh, which I am, in January of this year, the board authorized a board-restricted innovation fund that sets aside unrestricted bequests to provide the administration funds for new and creative initiatives. 
In other important votes this year, we helped us set aside funds for maintenance of our new building at 24 Farnsworth. We've had a strong focus on risk management, a tricky subject projecting what could happen and what we will do in case those things or that thing does happen. We've done an intensive study of the wages that we pay. And I'm very pleased to report that everyone who is employed by the Unitarian Universalist Association makes at or above a $15 minimum wage. Not only have we balanced the budget in, in conjunction with the work of the administration, but we took a look at, have taken a look at the budget through a racial justice lens and we're convinced that while we still have a ways to go, the UUA is making solid progress towards becoming a credible partner in this work. We're working in a variety of ways to strengthen our covenant of Unitarian Universalism. A few minutes, you'll hear from Reverend Dr. Susan Ritchie about our Renewing Covenant Task Force and ways that we might better be in discernment and relationship with one another. We were very pleased to learn that one of our new covenanting communities, the UU Cooperative Communities, which created the Lucy Stone Cooperative and the new Mar Margaret Mosley Cooperative, received a $100,000 grant from the Forbes Under 30 $1 million Change the World competition. And to make it even better, the Socially Responsible Investing Committee has also invested $15,000 in the effort whose mission is to create cooperative housing based in UU principles and purposes. Our governance working group, where our real wonks uh, do the work, uh, have worked very hard to ensure that we keep a, a very tight eye on the ends of the association and how we might engage our congregations and communities in a process that to renew the ends, to revisit and renew the ends that govern our efforts. As Jim told you, the Congregational Boundaries Working Group has continued its work and will have a re-emphasized and renewed focus on ministerial congregational boundaries in the coming year. As you probably know by now, and if you don't, stick around at 115, you'll learn more. There are three declared candidates for UUA president, all of whom have been certified. Board members and senior staff gathered with the three candidates recently to share our hopes and dreams for the future of Unitarian Universalism. We also have reviewed the oversight structure in place for UUA elections and decided to take a more active role than in past elections by hosting and funding the hosting of five candidate forums across the country prior to the election to be held in June of 2017. We've learned a tremendous amount from this process, from the new nomination process, many lessons learned, many opportunities for refinement, and we will get better at this together. And if that isn't enough, We've begun to plan for the creation of a moderator search committee by charging the appointments committee to begin to assemble the team by specifying the specific attributes needed. That is not to say that moderator key is already a lame duck. <laughs> President Morales and his leadership team presented a thorough and carefully conceived report evaluating the association's progress in pursuit of our stated ends otherwise known as monitoring, one of the most difficult aspects of policy governance. The board enthusiastically entered into deep and fruitful conversation with the staff as to the implications of their conclusions and the need to find more effective ways to measure the impact of our efforts. It was generally agreed that staff is developing strong evaluative skills and that more baseline information is needed in order to track our progress over time. It is difficult to measure the impact of the association's efforts in congregational and community life, but the board and the administration are committed to that effort. 
if you have any question about the collaboration that it takes to do this work, please ask a board member. The relationships are strong, the trust is powerful, and we're making real progress against our ends in collaboration with our staff. With deep appreciation and regret, regret we received the, uh, the resignation of Susan Weaver, our vice moderator, and enthusiastically expressed our appreciation for her excellent work, work in behalf of Unitarian Universalism. We also sadly said goodbye to the Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, former UUA Program and Strategy Officer, who stepped down after many years of dedicated service. Our very best wishes follow, continue to follow these two outstanding individuals who have been so very important to us. In summary, our progress, in my opinion, as a newcomer has been nothing short of remarkable. The level of trust, the level of accountability, not only among the board, but among the staff and between the board and the staff is quite frankly amazing. The year has been marked by a hard-won clarity of purpose and genuine sense of collaboration between the board and the administration. Our communications working group has made every effort to ensure that transparency provides full insight and awareness into the work of the association, which quite frankly is no small task. We have deep appreciation for all of those with whom we have partnered and for all of you who have offered feedback and advice and support. There is much work ahead, but the energy and the spirit and the support that we get from all of you will carry us well into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um, we're about to begin our um, debate on the business resolution, hearing those, and I want to reintroduce Tom Bean, who's joined us on the platform, and I want to welcome, uh, you've never met before, Nina Elgo. She's our parliamentarian. Thank you very much. She is uh, a justice on the Connecticut Supreme Court, and we are delighted to have her on the dais. Also, the Reverend Jennifer Brooks, our chaplain, I've asked to join the platform because, frankly, I think it's important to have some ministerial presence as we begin this debate, which has already, as you well know, triggered many responses from many of you. Um, so we're hoping to model um, something a little different this time. Um, so uh, let me first introduce Ted Fetter. Ted, where are you? Um, Ted Fetter facilitated the mini-assembly yesterday that considered the business resolution um, screening out investments in corporations complicit in the violation of human rights, including Palestinian rights. And I thought we'd do something different this year, have the facilitator of these mini assemblies give you sort of a context of how that went on and what the support was for what amendments. So um, you want to bring us up to date? Thank you, Jim. The mini-assembly on the proposed business resolution on screening out investments in corporations complicit in the violation of human rights, including Palestinian rights, was held late yesterday afternoon. As delegates are aware by now, as you're all aware by now, we worked from a perfected version from what's in your program book a version that is more relevant and more up-to-date. It was yesterday in yellow, and today the new version is in blue. The mini-assembly was well attended. Those who were present were consistently polite and respectful, keeping in mind that we were doing holy work. In addition to those in the Convention Center, we recorded votes from more than 30 off-site delegates. In the mini-assembly, we considered all eight amendments that were offered, and we took straw votes. 
informal votes to guide the Board of Trustees in discerning how to present this resolution to you for debate and discussion today. Following the mini-assembly, we decided to incorporate three of those proposed amendments into the new draft that is presented to you now. That's the blue version which we will be working from. The other five unincorporated amendments garnered little support, either in the hall or off-site. In every case, the straw votes we took on them were not close. Again, the mini-assembly demonstrated solid respect for opposing views, and I thank everyone who was there and who participated. Jim? Thanks, Ted. So our next order of business is to debate and vote on the business resolution that you have, screening out investments in corporations complicit in the violation of human rights, including Palestinian rights. And this is a time where I'd ask my vice moderator to make that motion, but not seeing the vice moderator as she's going to prepare for the breakout groups later, I've asked Ted Fetter to make the motion. Thank you again. Moved that the business resolution titled Screening Out Investments in Corporations Complicit in the Violation of Human Rights, Including Palestinian Rights, as amended in the mini-assembly, be adopted by this assembly. Thank you, Chad. Is there a second? The motion to adopt the business resolution has been made and seconded. And the chair calls on Larry Cooper, president of UU's for Justice in the Middle East, to make her of this motion for their statement on the subject. Thank you, Jim. No. Can oh, you Mr. hear me? Moderator? Yes. No. Okay. I recognize the uh, delegate at the procedures microphone. Okay. Uh, Thank I'm you. I'm Reverend Marlon Avenhart, a delegate from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'd like to move that we postpone this indefinitely. All right. Let me explain that. That, that needs a second if we're going and to I'd like to the, speak second. to it. There's a second. So to the delegates, there has been a motion to postpone indefinitely. This is a parliamentary process that will stop debate until we decide whether we want to postpone or continue the debate. So it's in motion. So it will suspend all other discussion until we have this debate. And we'll have a few minutes to debate it. Those in favor of um, this motion to uh, postpone indefinitely should go to the pro microphone and make a statement. And we'll alternate between those who want to support it, this uh, process of uh, postponing indefinitely, and then we'll go to the con for those who want to oppose yeah. the postponement. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you, Moderator Key. I'm Reverend Sarah Stewart, minister of the First Unitarian Church in Worcester and a former member of the UUA Board of Trustees. And I uh, am in favor of postponing debate on this resolution because it is not a proper business resolution according to our bylaws. Rule G418.2, a rule adopted by the General Assembly itself, says that a business resolution directly involves the administration of the association and that any resolution submitted which, taken as a whole, has as its purpose the making of a statement of social concern or principle should be deemed to be a study action issue for social justice. Thank you. Thank we you. have uh, someone at the procedures mic. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Thank you. I'm Bob Clegg from the Uni Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Frederick, Maryland. I have a point of order. Uh, my understanding of this motion is that it is a procedural motion, so I respectfully suggest that uh, uh, it should not be debated. That's as much a question as a point of order. No, we're, we, I've looked at this, and this is to be debated. This is a debatable uh, motion. So I go to the con microphone, those who wish to speak against uh, deferring. Um, my name is Curtis Bell. I'm from the First Unitarian Church in Portland, Oregon. 
And if you look closely at the resolves, you will see that this um, resolution directs the UUA to be governed by the same screening process that it has used uh, to do that into the future. We're calling on the UUA to adopt and to continue to use a screen that uh, includes, uh, that targets all companies that are complicit in human rights all in all areas of the world, including the Palestinian, the occupied Palestinian territories. This is therefore a direct request to the UUA and is a valid business resolution. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Jan Taddeo, a delegate from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Gwinnett in Lawrenceville, Georgia. I would like to call the question. Call the question. We need now to debate, uh, not debate, this is non-debatable, to, to vote on whether we want to call the question. This closes out, if passed, closes out the discussion and the debate on whether to uh, uh, defer indefinitely or not. So do we understand what we're voting on now? We're calling the question to, and voting. We're asking you to vote on whether you want to defer indefinitely or not. Do I have a second? We have a second. So get your cards ready. What I'm asking the delegates to do, if you want to vote on pro on deferring this, um, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. I have a parliamentarian this year. We're calling the question on whether to end the discussion and return to debating the issue. So we now understand the process? Are we good? For those who wish to end debate, please raise your card and vote yes. End debate, thank you, cards down. Those wishing to continue the debate on whether to defer, raise your card. The motion to further debate is defeated, so we'll now return to debating the merits of the... Uh, it passed, it passed. Are we good? Wrong question to ask. Do we understand? <laughs> I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Thank you, Moderator Key. I'm Karen Courtright from the Unitarian Church of Evanston. And the way I read the proposed business is that it's asking the UUA to continue doing what it is already doing. That's correct. Does this then meet the requirement of a business procedure, continuing it, a current business procedure? I can report that the uh, council has declared this a uh, legitimate business resolution as written, and our discussion will, our debate will be whether to pass it or not. And let me, uh, we sort of got ahead of the instructions I was going to give you, so let me take a little privilege here and uh, just say a few things before we continue this. The delegates had an opportunity yesterday to hear a panel discussion on the complexity of this business resolution. Under the rules you approved Thursday morning, we have 30 minutes to debate this motion before voting. The motion can only be amended by introducing amendments offered in the mini-assembly, but which were not incorporated. They are at the amendment desk, and if someone wants to move to incorporate those unincorporated amendments, you should move right to the desk to see if we want to vote on them at all. The motion can only be amended by introducing, uh, um, in other words, no new amendments can be made by this assembly. The business resolution requires two-thirds vote in the affirmative to be adopted. There must be 20 minutes of debate before a delegate may call the question. The motion to call the question must then be voted with the majority voting in favor to require an immediate vote on the motion. And that 20 minutes was on the original uh, debate, uh, the original motion which we moved on away from. The chair reminds those who wish to speak in favor or against the business resolution that debate must be confined to the merits of the business resolution. 
Avoid injecting a personal note into the debate. Do not attack or make any allusion to the motives of others or the, or the chair will rule the comments out of order. Each speaker is limited to two minutes and may only speak once. Subsequent speakers may, should make new points rather than repeat what others have said. There are four possible outcomes. Approve with a two-thirds vote, defeat with more than a one-third vote, move to postpone indefinitely, which we're in the thrust of right now, which effect kills the motion for this General Assembly and requires a majority vote. Move to assign the resolution to a committee to report their recommendations at GA 2017, and that also requires a majority of vote. Um, we have off-site delegates, of course, and I have uh, an instrument to tell me whether they're in the queue or not. So before we go any further, I'll recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Moderator Key, I believe there's, I, I need clarification because I called, I, we, I asked to call the question about the motion to defer this indefinitely, and I understand we just voted to, de to call that question. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've called that question yet. Yeah, we did. We had a vote on it. We, we voted to call the question. We didn't vote to whether to defer or to move forward. Shall I rephrase the question no. for the no. no, no. We no. voted. We voted to call the question, and the question we were calling you to vote. So, so we voted. To yes, stop, we're going to call whether the question. to cease debate and move. Right. To, no, 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 no. That was no, to call no. the question. To cease, to, to cease debate. That's out of order. You can't call the main motion for 20 no, no, minutes. No, no, no. We didn't. We're asking to call now to call for a vote on the motion that was made to defer indefinitely. I'll make it again. Thank you. It's, it's not again. It's, it's not again, Jim. Jim, what happened was we, someone called the question. Then we voted on whether we were going to call, the, whether, the, whether the body decided to call the question. The body did decide to call the question. Now we have to vote on the question. Ah, okay. Why don't we do that? So, Mr. Moderator, the vote now is, Mr. Moderator, the vote now, we, what's immediately in order right now is a vote on, a vote yes or no to postpone indefinitely. That is no, what is. No, that's not what we're voting on. We're voting on those votes. What is in order right now, okay. right now. Thank you. Seeing your welcome assistance tomorrow. from my, we are voting on whether to call to postpone indefinitely. That's correct, Mr. Moderator. Okay. We're voting on whether to postpone indefinitely. Uh, and I'm not sure who is at which my class, so I'll go to the pro side. Oh, let's vote. Let's vote. All those in favor, raise your cards to postpone indefinitely. No, 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 no. Hold them up for a while. Do that exercise of thank you. Those opposed? The motion to postpone indefinitely fails. Thank you. So you got ahead of me there. So now we're returning to the main motion. And we have someone at the con microphone. Huh? Yes, huh? I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Uh, well, Hi. Jim. Uh, my name is Jim. Alan Lindrup. I'm a delegate from the First Unitarian Society of Chicago. I uh, speak in opposition to this resolution uh, basically on two grounds. First, it's not really needed as a business resolution, as was raised up, because of the fact that the UUA's guidelines for social responsibility have already eliminated uh, our investments in any of the firms that were of concern to the proponents of this resolution. And second, particularly because this is an interfaith uh, assembly or general assembly where we're trying to encourage interfaith uh, relations, I think that this statement, which does not recognize the right of Israel to exist, where in the mini assembly there was, they voted down any recognition of the state of Israel to exist, will be taken in a broader American society as a UU statement against Israel and may be understood as being anti-Semitic. I know we don't under intend that, but it may be understood that. I think it will damage UU Jewish relations in this country. 
That will be its main effect. So I strongly urge we don't adopt this. The UUA is already carrying out the proper social responsibility. Thank like, you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Olivia Holmes from Peterborough, uh, New Hampshire. A point of order, would it be possible to have either the UUA treasurer or financial advisor explain the work that has already been done so we understand It would what be we're appropriate, voting? and thank you for suggesting it. And You're I'm going welcome. to call on David Stewart, chair of the uh, Socially Responsible Investment Committee. Have to hold on, please. Uh, to explain um, what they do and how they apply their screens. Could you come to the procedures, Mike, and um, explain that for us, David? Hello, David Stewart. Um, I'm a member of the Northwest Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Sandy Springs, Georgia, and the chair of the Socially Responsible Investment Committee. Um, with regard to screening uh, human rights, in conflict zones, this is a new screen to us. It was instigated because in towards the end of 2014, um, there were the uh, um, Holy Land principles that came uh, to our attention, which focused on this particular issue of uh, Palestinian human rights. Um, as a result of us not feeling that we could support that particular resolution that was being pushed into uh, a lot of companies, we decided to do our own investigation. As a result of that, we came up with the human rights um, screen that we did. Uh, it did screen out four companies, um, specifically the ones that are in the U.S. domestic market that, are, uh, that were referenced in the original version of this resolution. Um, there were other companies that, were, that could have been screened out, however, they were already screened out by other screens, um, specifically Exxon was screened out because of its involvement in human rights violations in Western Africa. So this was not targeted to a particular um, geography, in fact it is worldwide, and um, that is where we stand today with that particular screen. Thank you for that explanation. Was that helpful? And I'm going to go with apologies to the pro microphone so the maker of this business resolution can make the, the uh, statement. So, uh, Larry, I go to you at the pro microphone. Uh, 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 thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, yes, my name is Larry Cooper. I am president of Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East, a member of the First UU Congregation of Ann Arbor, and an associate member of the UU Fellowship of Marion County in Summerfield, Florida. First, I want to thank the 1,700 UUs from 300 congregations who signed our petition last winter, thereby assuring that this business resolution would be placed on the agenda of this General Assembly. That resolution, as printed in the program book, called on the UUA to refrain from investing in five corporations that were profiting from and supporting human and legal rights violations in the occupied Palestinian territories. Soon after that proposed resolution satisfied the criteria to be included in the agenda of this assembly, the UUA completed divestment from all of the corporations listed, and we applaud the UUA officials for doing so. The specific corporation divestment objectives of the proposed resolution were thereupon achieved, but a modified version of the proposed resolution is still necessary, one that formally calls upon the UUA to continue using human rights investment screens that effectively identify corporations complicit in the violation of human rights around the world, implicitly including the occupied Palestinian territories. The resolution before us today commends and endorses the actions taken to date by the UUA financial officials and upon being adopted by this assembly will provide them with denomination-wide support or grounding of the UU community needed to support their continued use of appropriate investment screens. Vote for human rights for all people, including those living under occupation, 
vote to apply our UU principles to our investment practices. Vote Thank yes. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. I want to make a point of clarification. This is David Stewart again, chair of the SRI committee. Um, I want to clarify the difference between screening and divestment. So specifically, let me define that for you. Divestment is the act of publicly and intentionally selling shares of a company as a part of a vocal movement due to a desire to reprimand them for their behavior. To be effective, it requires a coalition of divesting investors and widespread media coverage. The goal is to publicize a crisis with the hope of delegitimizing the perpetrators of the crisis. Negative screening, on the other hand, is the removal of companies that are rated as poor from a portfolio that are rated as poor performers on environmental, social, or governance behaviors. It does not include a public reprimand and, or require a coalition or a movement to be effectively implemented. Thank you, David. Uh, I have an off-site uh, delegate, um, and that off-site delegate will be represented at the con microphone by our volunteer. I recognize the volunteer at the con microphone speaking on behalf of an off-site delegate. I am representing Mike Manning of Unitarian Universalists of Clearwater, Florida. He says, my worry with this washing our hands of these investments is that it mostly feels good. Cannot more be accomplished by working from within and appearing with resolutions and other actions at annual meetings of these corporations? Thank you. I also have uh, someone in the uh, pro queue off-site, so I'll ask the volunteer who's um, speaking their words to uh, recognize that person at the pro microphone. Hello, I'm speaking for Hanan Watson from All Souls, All Souls Unitarian Church. My name is Hanan Watson. I'm a member of All Souls Church in New York. I joined All Souls in 2002 after attending a jazz and poetry meditation, a very balanced adult education lecture on the history of Palestine and Israel presented by a Jewish professor of Middle Eastern studies and two Sunday morning services. My late husband and I connected with UUism is instantly, both of us having come from Christian backgrounds, he an Episcopalian and I an Angelican. I was born in Jerusalem, Palestine. I was five years old when Israel was established and my family and I were of 750,000 Palestinians driven out by the violence inflicted on Palestinians in order to establish the state. I abandoned religion for 36 years. Because of me, all religions seemed to be a tool of war and oppression to which I could not subscribe. This changed when I discovered the UU faith. Since I joined All Souls, however, my UU faith has been changed frequently as I have encountered prejudice and fear of Palestinians within our community, most of which have been based on misinformation. On a personal level, I received comments by well-meaning friends in my congregation. You don't look like a Palestinian, they say. I have complimented, contemplated responding with a polite thank you. Instead, I have asked, what does a Palestinian look like? I believe deeply in our UU principles, but my confidence in our denomination's application of these principles has been shaken time and time again as I have experienced our community's enthusiasm to work for justice on so many important issues that have not included the occupation and oppression of Palestinians. To date, the term occupation has been on our do not disturb list, never to be uttered. This business resolution, which recognizes the military occupation with its associated human rights violations, restores my faith in our community's sense of justice for all and affirms that we have the courage to acknowledge the facts of the brutal occupation of the Palestinian land and lives. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Rachel Rott. I'm a member of Palomar Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Vista, California. My congregation supports a program called Hands of Peace that brings together Palestinian, Israeli, and American youth for three weeks of intense dialogue and relationship building in San Diego and Chicago. Three summers ago, my family hosted two young Palestinian women, Lean and Hadil. They are the daughters of my heart. I worry every day for their safety. I also have dear friends who are Reformed Jews here in the U.S. who share my desire for a two-state solution and who are equally disgusted with the Netanyahu administration. In our congregations and in this association, we hold people of many beliefs and backgrounds in the pluralism of our faith, in a covenant of acceptance and love. 
I worry that we are breaking covenant with the Jewish members of our congregations and with our American Jewish siblings, many of whom share our deep sorrow over the human rights concerns regarding Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people. Why do we have the capacity to tell Westboro Baptists that we love them, but we do not have the capacity to hear people whose stories shed light on real concerns about the negative repercussions of the BDS or Boycott Divest Sanction Movement that this proposal would align us with? Why do we have the capacity to welcome a Pentecostal minister into this body with open and loving arms, but in yesterday's mini-assembly, an attempt was made to bring in language that recognizes the right of Israel to exist, and it was roundly dismissed. Whether overt or not, this could be perceived as anti-Semitism. Whether intended or not, this effort does add to the growing hostility toward Jewish students on college campuses in this country. If anyone should be able to hold the duality of a free and safe Palestine and a free and safe Israel, it should be us, the Unitarian Universalists. This proposal is well intended. Believe me, I want to speak up on this. Thank you very much. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Hi, my name is Emma Stout, and I'm a delegate from Pilgrim House UU Fellowship in Arden Hills, Minnesota. I am so excited and inspired by the opportunity before us today to make a powerful statement of our faith, even when the process risks discomforting us. The dialogue so far has been emotional, and at this General Assembly, perhaps the most concerning aspect of the conversation around divestment has been the lack of Palestinian voices on the stage. It has been a missed opportunity to hear from Palestinians, and so I want to take this opportunity to quote my friend Nadia. Nadia says, with the majority of my extended family residing in the Gaza Strip, when do I get to share our story with the assembly? When do I get to tell you about my family's suffering as a result of the illegal op occupation and blockade of our home? Is my voice less important than the Jewish voices invited on the stage? Is my story or my family's story less valued than theirs. Nearly two million Gazans have lived under an illegal blockade for 10 years. What does that look like? The Palestinian people cannot feed their families. Over 90% of the water is undrinkable, 80% of the people are dependent on foreign aid, and 92% of the children in Gaza have exhibited signs of PTSD. HP, one of the companies that the UUA divested from in April, sells the Israeli military technology used to enforce this brutal blockade. We, Palestinian civil society, have called for the international community to divest from corporations complicit in the Israeli occupation. This is a non-violent action that all people of conscience can take to send the message that the Israeli occupation is anything but normal, anything but moral." End quote. I firmly believe, as a UU, that passing this resolution will send a strong message that UUs are opposed to human rights violations of the, against Palestinians. I'm voting with my conscience today to stand on the side of love. Will you? Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to try, I'm going to go to the uh, con microphone and then I'm go going to go to the amendment mic. Enough time has passed where we can consider amendments. I'm going to ask the uh, take a. Uh, I'm going to channel the the panel discussion of yesterday and ask that we refrain from supporting pros and cons statements. I think this could be a more discerning body if we just listened, processed, and then we'll ultimately vote. Uh, I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Reverend Howard Dana, and I serve First Parish in Concord, Massachusetts. I'm speaking against this resolution not because I don't believe in human rights for all, but because this unnecessary statement will do great damage to our work with American Jews who want the same improvements in Israel that we want. I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister in part because I know Unitarian Universalism can be a bridge builder between religions. We are at our best when we seek to span religious differences to find common humanity. This resolution will not build a bridge, it will build a wall. Whether we recognize it or not, this unnecessary statement will signal to our American Jewish neighbors 
that they have lost a religious friend. They will see the wall, even if we can't. I urge you to vote no on this resolution. Its passage is dangerous. Rather than promoting the human rights we all seek, it will make it much harder to work with our natural religious allies. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for responding. I appreciate that. Uh, we can now go to the amendment microphone. I have, excuse me, we have someone at the procedures microphone. Hi, I recognize I'm, the delegate at the microphone. Thank you. My name is Michael Brown. I'm a ministerial delegate from Peoria, Illinois. And we heard a few moments ago from a financial counselor explaining the difference between a screening process and a divestment. And it appears to me that the motion is about a screening process. And yet I hear from many delegates that we are discussing divestment. And so I would like clarification from we the financial We are not council. discussing divestment. We are okay. not, th that, that's not a part of the resolution, good. and it's not on the table. So we're, good. I we're, think that's we're trying good. to understand the discernment process and whether this should be passed or not. But thank right. you for the question. Thank you. I go to the amendment microphone. Would you make your amendment? David Shea, Valley Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Chandler, Arizona. I'd like to move unincorporated amendment number four. Can we get that on the screen? I don't have that in front of me. Do you have it over there? Do you have it? So the amendment that is being moved, essentially, uh, or, or put forward, uh, is adding that while recognizing the legitimacy of the State of Israel, the efforts of Israel to negotiate for peace with the Palestinian leadership and the importance of government to defend its, student, its citizens, and then it goes on, um, that did not have much support in the uh, mini assembly as I suggested, but is there a motion? Is there a motion to amend? I need a motion. Is there a motion to move this amendment? Yes. Is there a second? All right. We're ready to debate the amendment, but I'll first go to the procedures microphone. I am representing Jesse Ford from the U Fellowship of Corvallis in Oregon. He says, we seem to be considering the main motion. Is there going to be discussion about the unincorporated amendments? We need to do so before voting on the main motion. Of course he's right, and we're doing that right as we speak. So his, uh, his request came in before we did all of that. But uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the uh, pro side on this amendment, uh, this amendment that we're considering. And so you have your statement. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Uh, David Shea, once again. I have heard first and second hand accounts of the brutality of the occupation. I've been very moved by that. And I've also heard from the con microphone and what I've been hearing uh, it may not be what they're saying, but what I'm hearing is that there's a lack of balance. We're not looking at both sides. And I think our first principle should uh, compel us to look at both sides. Israel's right to exist, the many efforts Israel has um, made for peace. If we included that in the amendment, I think that would make it stronger in two ways. It would give us more support in this body, so we would vote by a larger majority or a majority, and I think it would have more effect in the world at large. So I think this would make, this amendment would make this resolution more powerful and help it attain its purpose more effectively. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the con mic to speak against this amendment. Thank you. My name is Ann Garcia, and I'm a member of the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Ann Arbor and an active member of Jewish Voice for Peace, the fastest growing Jewish organization in America. I'm here to suggest that as a Jewish woman, I have been fully accepted by Unitarian Universalists consistently. I see no risk in that area. I am not up here as a UU with Jewish heritage to give you permission to vote for this resolution because you do not need my permission or anyone else's to do the right yes. thing. I urge you to honor our UU tradition of acting out of love and compassion rather than fear. Do not be held hostage by this accusation of anti-Semitism. 
Criticism of the occupation of Palestine is not equal to questioning the existence of Israel. Criticism of the Israeli government is not equal to criticism of the people living in Israel. Criticism of Zionism is not equal to criticism of Judaism. Keep in mind there are many Zionists who are not Jewish and many Jews who are not Zionists. Admittedly, I know full well Jews have been victims in countless situations. But the Jewish people are not the victims in our discussion today. The human rights being trampled on in this situation are those of the Palestinians, the ones in refugee camps, the one in the open air prison known as Gaza, and the ones in the West Bank standing in a turnstile at a checkpoint for hours on end. There is nothing Jewish about military occupation, and there is nothing anti-Jewish about the UU's choice to stop profiting from it. Jewish values, old and new, echo those of us UUs. Isn't the UU's sixth principle for justice, equity, and compassion in human relations the same as when Rabbi Hillel stated in 110 BC, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. Isn't the six UU principle also mirrored in the findings from a recent survey, which revealed that 84% Thank you, thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Mr. Mar uh, Mr. Roderick, thank you. My name is Morgan Johnston from Arlington Street Church in Boston. As a new first time delegate, I may be out of uh, turn here, but I have a point of information, I believe. The agenda says that we are speaking about a business uh, a movement for divestment. You recently said that we were not speaking about divestment, and I am a little Let bit me, confused. That is true. The original business resolution was on divestment. It was amended to take out divestment. So today we're not talking about divestment, whether to or not to. We're talking about the merits of, right now we're talking about the merits of the amendment to the main motion. Thank you. Thank you. I go to the delegate at the pro microphone. Hi, my name is Vanstrom Dracul. I am delegate for the, con the Unitarian Fellowship of the CALP, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of the CALP, Illinois. Uh, I am in favor of the amendment because in, a, in an environment where things are usually uh, misunderstood or misinterpreted, it is important to be very clear that at the same time we support the Palestinians and, and we are in favor of, of respecting their human rights, we are also in support of Israel to exist. We, we support both. We just don't support the violence and the discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone to speak about against this amendment. Uh, Sally Gellert, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Uh, I speak against this amendment on two grounds. First, I think the, putting that long and complex a clause into an already long, complex clause just makes it unreadable. Secondly, I don't think it's needed. This is basically a, uh, a statement that supports screening against human rights violations, particularly but not exclusively in the occupied Palestinian region. And I think the, it's, a, it's a superfluous statement in support of the State of Israel that I don't think it really belongs. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. I'm Hillary Krivchenia, Minister of Countryside Church, Unitarian Universalist in Palatine, Illinois. And it's uh, very difficult to go back and forth between these microphones to debate something so close to my heart. When I visited the occupied territories in 2006, I was shocked by what I saw and the degree of brutality of the occupation and I strongly support a statement from the Unitarian Universalist Association calling Israel to take more seriously the kinds of negotiations that could bring an end to such a conflict and also 
bring some uh, peace and a two-state solution. However, I think it's essential to add this kind of wording because also while I was there, I saw that the world would judge Israel differently than it would judge other countries because the level of anti-Jewish feeling globally is still incredibly powerful. And I would not want from this association a statement that both, that, that only condemned this behavior without recognizing that these two issues are so linked. And I'd like to pretend that it's simply a clear cut issue, but the injuries are so ancient and so historical that if we don't speak to the pain of both parties, we are not doing justice to this issue. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Reverend Jay Wolin, serving our congregation in the Quad Cities, Davenport, Iowa. I ask that we call the question on this amendment. Is there a second? We're voting now on whether to stop debate. So if you're wanting to move on back to the main motion, uh, you would want to vote in favor of calling the question, which would be a vote up in the air, a card up in the air. Likewise, if you're ready to continue the debate, uh, I'll ask that question, you'll vote against it. So those in favor of calling the question and ceasing debate, raise your cards. Thank you, opposed. The question is called and the amendment, uh, let's now vote on the amendment. I'm, I'm learning, three years in, it's gonna be good. You're, you're going to be surprised how good I'm going to be in 2019. <laughs> so, those in favor of amending the document in front of you uh, with the, uh, incorporating this amendment, please vote by saying aye, raising your cards. This is in favor of the amendment. Thank you. Those opposed? Ooh. Let me consult. Uh, let's start all over again, and I'll consult with my compatriots here. Those in favor of incorporating this amendment, please raise your cards and hold them high. You're going to have to hold that elbow up while we do this with my panel of experts. Thank you. Those opposed to this amendment, please raise your cards. I have an opinion, but I want to check with some others. Thank you. Thank you. You can rest your arm. The amendment passes. Thank you. So now we're returning to the, um, the there's another amendment. Yes, I recognize the uh, delegate at the amendment microphone. Uh, I'm Reverend Marlon Avenard, the senior minister in our All Souls Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'd like to pro uh, propose that we vote on amendment number one. And I'd like to speak. Did we get that screened up? Could you read it for us, Marlon? No, you can do it there if you like. I just need to be able to see it. I, I don't have it in front of me. Okay, let me, I'll, let me read it then. I can see it. Whoops. I can't see it. Is the amendment to strike included? Okay, this is several changes. This amendment, uh, should you vote on it, is uh, uh, excluding, including Palestinian rights. So the, the title of the uh, business resolution would be screening out investments and corporations compl complicit in the violation of human rights. Um, and then there's a line under that that uh, adds, which may result in associated violations of human rights. And then the next uh, several lines down, 20, encompasses all areas of the world, including but not limited to. And then line 22, um, following leaders and supporters of an international movement to end the violations of human rights by refraining and then replace line 28 um, with the following, violation of human rights around the world, including but not limited to areas in the occupied 
Palestinian territory. So obviously this amendment is uh, trying to uh, broaden the business resolution to include human rights violations in, uh, all over. Uh, I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sally Gellert, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. Uh, point of personal privilege, Mr. Moderator. Is it possible to get the uh, time clock showing constantly on the screen? That's I'm a fair request. I can't see it either. I'm relying on the bell. <laughs> Uh, and so I'll ask my tech deck uh, associates, can we simultaneously show the amendment and the, the uh, timer? I'm not sure we can, but we'll, um, we'll make the request. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Kate Fraley, Charlottesville, Virginia. I guess this is a personal something or other. I'm sorry? Uh, personal privilege. I have a concern about the uh, assessment of the hand raised votes. I was sitting behind that uh, post and I couldn't see you and I couldn't see them. So I have a concern that the visual assessment of the handheld votes is not uh, complete well, because over there and over there you can't see. Speaking for myself, but I'll consult with others, I thought it was pretty easy to, to read the numbers. So uh, thank you for your raising the issue. Uh, I recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Cravart Graham from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I raise a point of, pers of information. I, I believe you just made a statement about what this amendment means, uh, stating that you thought it broadened the um, human rights violations that this particular proposal would address. I, I don't know that I read it the same way. The, um, the proposal already addresses all human rights violations and calls particular attention to the Palestinian issue. This proposal, it seems to me, would remove Palestinian from the language. Am I, am I clear or no, am you're I correct. misinterpreting? I mean, you're right. Thank you for raising the issue. Are we ready? Okay, so we have an amendment uh, being proposed. I'll go to the uh, delegate at the pro microphone. This is Reverend Marlon Ivanhoe, the senior minister from All Souls in Tulsa, <laughs> Oklahoma. And I would, I would like to say that um, as someone who's deeply committed to justice, as someone whose ministry is deeply committed to justice, also to interfaith understanding, I want to make sure this body knows that many of many 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 of our ministers have been contacted by local rabbis in our community that have expressed similar views to the rabbi who expressed to this entire body at the opening ceremonies that it would mean something very powerful to the Jewish community if we pass this resolution that and the reason that I'm voting on this amendment is be, is because this amendment takes the Palestinian question out, but remain, keeps us screening for human rights violations. So in effect, this continues exactly the intent of everything we're trying to accomplish here in terms of screening, and yet it takes out this divisive issue around specifically naming the Palestinians, which is going to harm our relationships in the interfaith community with the Jewish community. People keep pointing to the fact that the Presbyterians and the Methodists have passed a similar resolution. One of the differences is they don't have so many Jews in their body. They probably have very few, if any, whereas we have a lot of people with Jewish heritage in our congregations, a lot of mixed marriages with Jewish heritage. By naming this specifically Palestinian, the Palestinian issue, we do not increase the screening in any way, shape, or form all we do is upset and damage our interfaith relationships and, and create a lot of damage in terms of our support. And in a general assembly that's based on the idea of religious pluralism in the heartland, that we are going to draw faiths together for us to single out the Palestinian issue when it's not necessary, both to, for the screening and for the fact that we've, the UUA has already made a commitment to this, I, I would like us to vote pro on this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I have um, a, a delegate off-site with a procedural question. Do I have a volunteer to deliver that, please? Pull the microphone down so we can hear you. 
I'm speaking on behalf of Julia Prentice from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Marin and San Rafael, California. She says, is this a two-thirds requirement to pass or simple majority? This is a simple majority on the amendment. When we pass the mo whatever the main motion, whatever the main motion ends up being as amended requires a two-thirds. Thank you for the question. Uh, is there someone else? I recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. Michelle Liebensmack from uh, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Athens. This is going way back in this discussion, but I, when the uh, proposal for tabling this business uh, procedure was presented, and then the, uh, the, the rationale was given at that microphone, they referenced a piece in the bylaws. For me, very visual person, it would have been really helpful to have that projected onto the screen so I could see what we were talking about. And then shortly thereafter, my colleague was very helpful to you know, be pulling up the uh, bylaws on his phone. But then it went to call the question before we even had a chance, especially for me as a novice to parliamentary procedure, to have an understanding of what really is going on. So I feel like the train left the station before I had a true understanding of thank, this. Thank you for that observation. Let, let me just say once again, we go over the rules at the beginning, we have orientations, we have webinars, and we encourage first-time delegates to be familiar with the bio, if they want to be engaged in the argument. So I, I accept your comments. Thank you very much. I now need to go to the next delegate in the procedures, Mike. Uh, good morning. My name is Marcus, and I'm with the UU Church of Peoria. Um, I, my question is, we did pass an amendment just a moment ago uh, that added Israel into it, and now we're having an amendment that's removing Palestine from it. Is it able to reconsider the last motion if we remove Palestine from this motion? And the other question is, can uh, someone asked before, can we call account on the last amendment? Can you call the question? Are, is that your, what, are you no. calling the question? Call account on the last amendment. No, I have to say that we've moved beyond that. We've had three people observe the count, and I think we're fine there. I know that people are never happy with the result if they're on the side that didn't carry the day, but thank you. I, for I actually voted for the last amendment, but there was kind of some confusion within the audience, and a delegate can ask to have a, a count called, so no, I'd like to call no, a count. Thank, thank you. Right. <laughs> now, let me just tell you that the uh, procedures mic is, I'm okay with this, but it's consuming lots of times and keeping us from the... Uh, discussion of the amendment, and we haven't gotten to the main motion. My name is Howard Tolley from St. John's Unitarian Church in hey, Cincinnati. Hey, hey. Although I think the mic's not on for you. Try it again. My name is Howard Tolley from St. John's Unitarian Universalist Church in Cincinnati in UU Justice, Ohio. I raise a point of order. When you called for the delegates in the hall to hold up their cards and vote, we were immediately seeing on screen percentage pro, percentage con. I have, spoken, I have spoken with the technical people. I think it is inappropriate while we are voting in the hall to be shown the count of those who are voting off-site, and I would urge you to find a way to delay that display Thank you. until after we have completed voting Thank in the you. hall. Thank you. And in uh, future, I don't know whether we'll get it done by next General Assembly, but our hope is to move to an electronic system that we see the votes pretty instantaneously. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. I'm Valerie White from the Unitarian Church of Sharon, Mass. And I question whether okay, right. this new amendment is in Before, order given yeah. the vote well, on the yeah, previous yeah. amendment. Thank you. It is in order, and we are debating it. And um, I'll go to the next delegate in the procedure microphone. Hello, this is Alessandro Gagliardi from UUSF, uh, San Francisco. I believe this would be a point of personal privilege, but. Um, or privilege, but I'm wondering if it's possible that we could hear all the amendments prior to discussing and voting. I'm on sorry, them. hear all the all the proposed amendments because they interact with each other. And the last amendment, this amendment, changes how we <laughs> perceive the last amendment. This is this is one of the challenges of our mini assembly and our technology. But uh, it is difficult to go through that, and we don't have time, frankly, to go through all the amendments. We will not get to all the amendments to be considered. So time will soon be running out. Uh, so, no, we cannot. The, the purpose of perfecting the any business resolution occurs in the mini-assembly. That's where you have the biggest impact. We are trying to get to as an efficient vote as possible on the main 
motion after we consider this amendment. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Point of order, Gigi Gordon, Marquette Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Marquette, Michigan. I question whether the last amendment that was voted that, uh, favorably is properly included in a business resolution. Say more. Why? We voted and It we... strikes me as a, as a statement of policy. Principle has nothing to do with how the organization conducts its business. Right. Um, and let me, let me, uh, thank you for sharing your views, but it is in order and it has been voted into the, you will ultimately get a chance to vote the, the amended document up or down. I recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. Reverend Nina Gray from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Bozeman. Uh, some of the folks who have been speaking have suggested that this amendment does, takes out Palestine, removes Palestine. It does remove it from the title, but not from the language of the resolution. I wanted people and to be clear about that. It's included in the language of the, of the, of the resolution, of the amendment, with, along with the words, but not limited to. That is true. Thanks for bringing it to the attention. I now go to the delegate at the pro microphone. Con, it's con time. Excuse me, con. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone Thank on you. this amendment. My name is Reverend Dr. Finley C. Campbell, a delegate from the First Unitarian Society of Chicago and also an international Zionist and a former Christian Zionist. The issue is not everyone who is suffering, as our Black Lives Matter folks argue, you can't say all lives matter when you're talking about Black Lives Matter. I disagree with that in general, but in this particular case, I'm in agreement. The Palestinian situation must be right in the title and in the body of the document. This is not about all the oppression going on everywhere, though horrible as it may be. The problem is that at our opening ceremony, Rabbi Rick Jacobs said that he opposed the resolution before our General Assembly concerning what we now call screening, because it will cause division, because it might prevent a two-state solution for Israel-Palestine. That suggests that there's already a peace process in place concerning Israel-Palestine. That is why we must focus very sharply on the issue of the Palestinian brothers and sister and their particular suffering. If there is going to be peace and understanding, there cannot be that by sweeping under the rug the nature of the particular oppression that is going on in the Palestine-Israel society. Therefore, we must recognize finally that Apartheid didn't hit everybody. Apartheid was very specific to a specific people in a specific country. Apartheid was a system of racial segregation in a specific country directed against a specific people. To talk about all the suffering everywhere as if it was somehow equal is a sort of a disservice to the discernment process of making a difference between what is all suffering and the particular suffering that's in our faces. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone, but the, uh, the chair would not be disappointed in a motion to call the question. Well, I recognize the, um, the delegate at the procedure microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Kravar Graham from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I actually came up for a point of information or a point of personal privilege. Certainly. Um, there's been some question at the procedural microphone about what exactly this particular amendment does or does not do. We got an opportunity of about a minute or a minute and a half of actually seeing the text of the amendment on the screen. I think it would be helpful for the delegates, thank you, to have it up on the screen again so that we could review it. Let's have this up on the screen while we're considering, um, while we're considering the, the delegate at the procedure microphone. If we can get it up briefly before I recognize. My name is Reverend Anastasia. I'm a delegate from All Souls Unitarian Church in Indianapolis, and I'd like to call the question on the Oh, amendment. the question has been called. Is there a second? All right. We are now voting on whether to vote on this amendment. 
I'm sorry to vote on calling the question. All those in favor of calling the question and stopping debate, please raise your cards. We're voting. Thank you. I, I drafted the amendment, and I want those to opposed to calling the question. I didn't get to the question is called. We are now going to vote on amending this, uh, devoting the amendment up or down. I'll go to the de delegate at the procedure mic. Yes, my name is Kurt DeWeese. I'm with the Abraham Lincoln Congregation in Springfield, Illinois. I drafted this amendment. I didn't have an opportunity to explain it. There have been people explaining it wrongly, and I think I should have the opportunity to present it. Why don't you go and explain the amendment really quickly? I would, I would urge the delegate body to not be so murmuring. We have a point of order. We're point of order. Yes, yes. We have some uh, confusion here at the delegate mic. I believe the question has been called and has been seconded. Question has been called and, and, and seconded. And we're ready to vote on whether to we must vote uh, now. Vote. Debate. We must now vote. I have not recognized the delegate at the procedure microphone. Hold on. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm Jim Ansel from the unit. Okay. That's right. We are now voting on the amendment. Does the delegate at the pro microphone want to speak on the amendment? I would appreciate that opportunity. Parliamentarian, help. The, the debate is closed. Right. right. We're voting on the amendment. All those in favor of including this amendment in the, uh, to the main motion, raise your card. We're voting to include it. Thank you. Those opposed to this amendment. The amendment clearly fails. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. On a point of order, um, and this may be a little complicated, so please, please bear with me. Um, since the, um, the motion now, as it was amended in the, uh, the mini assemblies, uh, since it basically is, is telling the uh, telling the UUA to keep doing what it's already doing, since that means whether we pass this resolution or don't pass this resolution makes no difference because they're, they're going to keep doing what, you know, essentially if we, if we you're ask correct. Them, the, essentially, uh, yes. I'm saying then, I'm, I'm asking the moderator to rule, please, that the entire main motion is out of order because it is, is dil it's um, non-substantive, it is, it's not changing thank, anything. Thank you. The council has determined that this is in order. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. It, Denny Davidoff, uh, the Unitarian Church in Westport. And uh, Mr. Moderator, I just wanted to commend you for extending a courtesy to the delegate who had written the amendment, who requested as a point of personal privilege that he be allowed to explain his own amendment. And you agreed to let him do that, and then kind of got shouted down uh, by the body, which is very invested in process. I wanted to thank you for adding a note of courtesy uh, into this body, which is very, very rules-oriented. Nobody knows that better than me, having uh, been up there. But, but. Maybe we could practice courtesy, and maybe uh, as we go through future amendments on this and on other uh, points of, of business at, at the General Assembly, perhaps uh, and from now on you could ask for the maker of the amendment to get to explain her or himself, because that was a really nice idea you had. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Point of personal privilege, I would ask that we uh, remind the delegates of the photography policy, specifically individuals taking photographs of people while voting and posting them without their permission is not appropriate. It's only by official photographers. Thank you. Thank you. So are we ready? I recognize the delegate. Are we ready to vote on the main motion as amended? We have rejected the last amendment. Are we OK? Yeah, we're back to debate on the main motion, excuse me. Um, and I believe, and I'm looking for confirmation, then I will go to the pro microphone. I think that's where we ended up. So I recognize the delegate. At, now I've got a delegate at the procedure microphone. 
Um, hi, my name is Francine Hahn. I'm from Cedarhurst Unitarian Universalist in Maryland, and I would just like to call a vote on the main motion as amended. Thank you. Is there a second? There is a second. So now we're voting on whether to call the main motion as amended. We get this. All in favor of calling the main motion? Thank you. Those opposed? Thank you. Debate is closed, and we're ready to vote on the motion, the business resolution, as amended uh, this morning. So are we ready with that, and do we understand that? I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Hello, yes, my name is Alyssa Goss. I'm from University Church in Seattle, and it is my understanding that we, as the main motion, are required to have 20 minutes of debate on the main motion. We have not had 20 minutes on the main motion. I think we have, but I'll check. I think you're right, we need 20 minutes, but I thought we had, I'll check. Yeah, we've had more than 20 minutes with the amendment, so we're in good shape. We're ready to vote. I'm sorry, I'm confused though. I thought main motion is considered the amendments. It's the main motion. We had a main motion debate before we got to the amendments. But so that we're wasn't good. a full 20 minutes. Thank you. I appreciate your bringing that question to the floor. I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Uh, uh, Jim Ansel, uh, Unitarian Congregation in uh, Shelter Rock. I I'd like to uh, you know, raise a point of order, and this, uh, I'd like to. Uh, uh, the parliamentarian to uh, be the one uh, making the ruling on this. Uh, you know, here we have uh, a, 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 a motion, and, and uh, I, I find it completely wrong that we should go from uh, an, an, an amendment to, 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 to voting on a motion without discussion. Thank I feel you. that's totally inappropriate. Thank you. I have checked with my parliamentarian, and we are ready to vote. I'm sorry. The uh, procedures mic is out of order at this point in time, and we're ready to vote on the main motion as amended. That's what has been voted on. And so here we go. Are you ready to vote on the main motion as amended? I have consulted with the parliamentarian, and we're ready to go. I know that you're not happy with that, but are we ready to vote? Those in favor, I'd ask you to... They, can I call on the chaplain to give us some words of reflection, and that this is a holy place, and that we have work to do. Please, I'm sorry. Everybody is out of order until I give the this chaplain some order. time to speak. This is obviously a very emotional topic. and. We've spent most of the time discussing amendments. So people are frustrated. And people feel strongly on both sides. And we don't want to alienate our interfaith partners, but we also want to do what's right. We have to recognize that there are many problems with Robert's Rules of Order and the process that is complicated in an assembly this size when so many amendments can be offered. If the parliamentarian has ruled, though, that's where we stand. And it's a difficult position for all of you to be in. But we have to move forward with the rules that we have. And I'm sorry that it's unsatisfying. We worked over the last year to make the rules, the whole process of debate on contentious and emotional issues better. We obviously still have more work to do. But for now, I hear the parliamentarian saying that the vote on the main motion is in order. And I can't do anything about that. That's a question for the parliamentarians. Can they suspend the rules? We have some consensus from the parliamentarian. 
So we, uh, we have not exceeded our time limit, so we do have a few more minutes to debate the main motion as amended. Thank you. I now recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. In Vermont, it's a point of personal privilege. Whenever we get to it, could you have somebody read the motion as we're going? Because I was sitting back there not knowing exactly, with the back and forth, exactly where we are, and I would just appreciate that when we get there. Well, where do okay. Thank you. <laughs> I now go to the pro microphone for people who want to speak in favor of the main motion. Thank you. Amanda Weatherspoon, ministerial candidate, delegate with the Church of Oakland in uh, Oakland, California. Our final, and our final UU principle states that there is an interdependent web of existence that we are all a part of. Collective liberation means that none of us can reach true liberation until all of us do. The social challenges that we face, that we head as you use, immigration, reproductive justice, black and brown racism, mass incarceration, these cannot and must not be separate from the apartheid in Palestine. And on behalf, many of the members of the Black Lives UU Collective, we not only support not investing in these corporations, but we denounce fully and completely the occupation and degradation of the Palestinian people, understanding that it is impossible to reach black and brown liberation here if our brown brothers and sisters and siblings in Palestine are not reaching liberation there. We have been, they have been robbed of their personhood, and we can no longer sit in silence as people, of, as people of faith while they remain that their rights are being violated. I ask where we will stand in history. I ask where we will stand as people of faith and where we stand as human beings, and I urge everybody to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. I go to the uh, delegate at the con microphone. Thank you, Moderator Key. I'm Reverend Sarah Stewart, Minister of the First Unitarian Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. Yesterday morning, we heard the Public Conversation Project help guide a conversation about Israel and Palestine, and we heard leaders in our faith speak from their hearts. We heard the hard conversation that happens when values are in tension and how that conversation can take place in relationship. And I want to call us back to that conversation and that relationship. I opposed this resolution based on our parliamentary procedure and our bylaws. And that might sound like it's just business or it's just technical, but our bylaws are our decisions already made about how we are in conversation and relationship with each other. And our bylaws passed by former general assemblies tell us that we have these hard conversations over time in our congregations and communities, speaking from the heart, sharing our values, respecting our relationships with one another. This business resolution will not make any substantive change in the work of the association. Our investment committees are already doing good, faithful work to balance risk, reward, return and justice on behalf of our faith. Our process calls us to have this conversation in faithful covenant with one another over time in our communities. We should not think that a 30-minute debate on the plenary floor is somehow more just or more real than those heartfelt conversations that we are capable of having in community. I call us back to those conversations. I ask us to vote no on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the time is up on the um, our original debate period. Uh, and I'll go to the delegate at the procedures mic, and then I can entertain a motion to call the question if the body is so moved. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Good morning. I'm Martin Kaplan from the Bucksmont. Uh, I, I'm Martin Kaplan from the Bucksmont Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Warrington, Pennsylvania, and I move to call the motion. Thank you. I say a second. So we're now voting on whether to call the question and cease debate. Those in favor of calling the question, raise your cards. 
Clearly this is supported, but those who oppose calling the question raise their cards so we all get a chance to vote. The question has been called. We are out of 30 minutes of time, and so we are ready to vote on the main motion as amended. So we're going to try to get that posted, uh, and give me just a second. I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Uh, uh, Jim, Jim Ansel from uh, Unitarian Congregation in Shelter, Iraq uh, for Forum in uh, Manhattan, Long Island. We, you know, we've had a lot of uh, confusion here uh, between uh, the, you know, time uh, being e eaten up by the pr procedures, the procedures mic, uh, somewhat in inappropriate, and, and uh, we've used up a, a lot of time here on uh, 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 amendments. Uh, uh, I don't think we, I think we need a little more time for, for discussion, and I, I, I want to make a motion. Somebody would have to move I, I, to I, extend I, I, debate. I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to move to, to extend debate. Is there a second? There is a second. It's out of order. It is out of order. I am so advised. Thank you. Before we vote, uh, I'm going to call our chaplain back and remind us that we are in a religious body, and then we will try to get the, the full piece of paper in front of you, and I'll read the amendment before we vote. Je Jennifer, Reverend Brooks. It doesn't always feel like holy work, does it? <laughs> and yet, that's what we aspire for this work that you are doing right now to be holy work. I'd like you all to take a moment and turn to someone next to you and take their hands. This may be someone who agrees with you. It may be someone who disagrees with you. Find someone ahead of you or behind you or next to you and take their hands. And let's take turns repeating these words. I put my hands in yours so that we may do together what I cannot do alone. Go ahead. We are here to do together what as individuals we cannot accomplish alone. We are not always sure about whether what we decide in these assemblies, we're not always in agreement about whether it's the right thing. We are doing our best. Let this work, whatever the outcome, be holy work. Amen. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Kirk, do we? Kirk. I'm sorry, this is out of order. We, we well, are ready to vote. I'm, Am I right, I'm, correct, I'm, parliamentarian? I'm going to ask for a hard count. We will have to wait until we vote before you ask for that. Okay. And you'll have to have 99 other delegates to agree with you. <laughs> and that will take a while. Um, you, may, you may want to think about trusting the people on the stage to survey the hands and then do a counted vote if it's clear that it is close. Let's go. Hold on just a moment. So what we're about to do is have you vote on this amendment. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, no, this business resolution is handed out this morning as amended on line 14. So if you've got the document in front of you, it's line 14. And as you get over to the two-thirds of the way into the sentence, in many ways over many years, comma, we are inserting that phrase that's on the screen. And what we are inserting is, while recognizing the legitimacy of the State of Israel, the efforts of Israel to negotiate for peace with the Palestinian leadership, and the importance of a government to defend its citizens, and then it picks up the, uh, well, we, this that isn't what language. We're voting on. We're voting are we clear on where we're voting? And I'll recognize the delegate in just a moment, but I want to make sure that we're all clear on that. Are we reasonably clear that we're voting whether to approve this or not. It requires a two-thirds vote. Okay, no, that's, yeah, that's basically what I'm...
I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Point of personal, pri uh, sorry, Let's is wait this on? Mic. Say mm -hmm. it again. Uh, yes, please. On a point of personal privilege, um, what was just shown on the screen is only part of what we are voting on. Um, if, if somehow it could be communicated to everybody the whole of the motion that we're voting on. Somebody has suggested to me, if you could please hold up the blue, oh, you're the right, blue sheet. A, I've got yeah. the wrong. I understand we are voting on the blue sheet plus the amendment. So we've already voted on that amendment. So we're voting on everything, the blue sheet plus the As amendment. As amended. Thank right. you for the clarification. Mm, it's blue, not yellow. And I'm not colorblind. Are we ready to vote? We still have people at the procedures mic, but I'm beginning to believe that they're out of order. So, let's vote. I know this is hard, and I will ask you to refrain from celebrating no matter how the outcome is. Thank you, Reverend Brooks, for, I think, putting us in the right mode and grounded. So all of those in favor of approving this business resolution as amended down on the screen on line 14, please raise your cards and hold them for a while. This is going to take a while, folks. We're voting in favor. Thank you. Those opposed? Hold them up, just a moment. Thank you. We believe it is close and we should count the votes. So I would key up the uh, tellers to be ready to vote by sections. This is going to make your arm ache, so just be prepared. So if the tellers are in place, I'll wait for a high sign from them, and then I'll ask for a vote, a counted vote. Are we ready? This will be better next year with electronics that show the votes. Save us time. Are we ready? We're ready. Okay, so the delegates who wish to vote in the affirmative for this proposed business resolution as amended that we've approved, please raise your cards and you're going to have to hold them for a while until the teller in your section lets you lower your arm. You know, we did this yesterday. You're just going to have to, you can switch hands, I suppose. That might be a little confusing to the tellers. Tellers, how are we doing?
Thank you for your patience. Uh, the uh, tellers have, I'm advised the tellers have completed their count of those who favor passing this resolution. Now, those of you who do not favor this resolution, place your cards, and again, you're going to have to hold them for a while. It will take 33.4 percent of you to deny passage of this. So just keep those arms up for a bit. I'm going to ask uh, our musicians to give us a little, little interim music here, make it go a little more interestingly for us. Our ever-ready music director. All right, we've got Sarah Dan Jones. We're going to do a little breathing. We've been thinking about breathing all week. First of all, I just want you to breathe with me quick. And then we're all going to drone. We're going to breathe together. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe. I breathe in. Listen to each other when I breathe in.
hands up. Well, I breathe out. I breathe out, Lord. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out, Lord. When I breathe in, I breathe this song has been sung a lot this week. My hope is that the next time we sing it, we sing it because we don't need to sing it. But don't stop breathing. Yeah. Repeat as needed. Thank you for that. And thank you to the delegates for your lights and, and breathing. Um, The boat will be available in a minute. We're counting and double checking, and we've got the offsite to include. So I'm, you will, that will be announced within three or four minutes. But I would like to uh, bring up uh, Sarah, uh, Susan Geckler to tell you the AIW uh, that will put them in motion to be on the final agenda tomorrow for uh, AIW debate and vote on Sunday afternoon. Susan? Thank you. I also want to say that um, before I make the announcement of which of the AIWs we will be placing on the final agenda, that all are important and worthy causes. And I encourage you, as you are called, to work on whatever it is that moves you, whether it is one of those selected or not. Based on the votes of the delegates, the Commission on Social Witness moves to admit the following three issues to the final agenda for a vote on Sunday. The first one is proposed AIWA, Build Solidarity with Muslims. And maybe we should just out of respect for everyone, um, not you know, be approving or disapproving um, because there are some who will not be selected. The second one is proposed AIWB, some guns, all guns, legislating appropriate restrictions. And the final one to be placed on the agenda for Sunday is proposed AIWF, stop the hate, protect and support our transgender brothers, sisters, and siblings. So, the motion to admit the three issues to the final agenda for a vote on Sunday has been made. Is there a second? There's a second. So this motion is not debatable or amendable. Aren't you relieved? <laughs> I know I am. This motion is not debatable or amendable, so the, those in favor raise those green cards to admit them to the agenda. It's all we're agreeing to. I knew you'd want to do this. Thank you. Those who are opposed to putting these on the final agenda? Good. The motion carries. We'll talk about these tomorrow afternoon. Um, I think I'm going to call on uh, Susan uh, Ritchie to report on our little change-up in what we were going to have you do for the last hour. Yes, so joyous news. We have yet another opportunity to participate in the collective spiritual discipline of flexibility. <laughs> Our task force on recovering was to offer you in this time a report and an introduction to our work, and then we were going to ask you to go into breakout groups, um, and we have a fabulous cadre of trained facilitators that were going to assist you in this. Um, we're, we're on to our plan G. So um, our plan at this point is that we will show you the video report we've made of our work um, during the time that we had scheduled tomorrow to give you the report of the breakout groups that aren't happening. You're catching on really quickly, right? Um, so if I could just give some instructions to our tellers. The tellers had um, pieces of paper for, to hand out now, um, if we could hold those until tomorrow. And if I can give uh, the facilitators my heartfelt thanks for the work that they won't perform, <laughs> I would like to do that.
That's what our faith needs, flexibility, agility, the uh, readiness to change. I now invite our secretary, Rob Eller Isaacs, to, he probably has some announcements, just guessing. Friends, we set a completely unreasonable goal for an offering at General Assembly. The Saturday morning offering has never come close to raising the kind of money that we suggested it might. We suggested a goal of $60,000, which is quite remarkable for a Saturday morning offering, probably close to double what we've ever done before. And I wish to tell you that we raised 89000 $480 in support of Black Lives UU. The movement has come home, Carlton. On behalf of my colleagues of the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism Organizing Collective, Kenny Wiley, Lena K. Gardner, Leslie McFadden, myself, Alandria, thank you so much for your engagement in this. We say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. What you have shown is the commitment of our movement in the 21st century to being a faith of the 21st century, acknowledging that our lives matter and recognizing that all lives will matter when black lives matter, when black lives matter indeed. And Lena's going to share something too. I'll be really brief because I, I know y'all want to get out of here. I just want to say thank you for investing in black leadership. Thank you for investing in black lives. Let this be a beginning. Let this be a beginning of a journey together. Let us continue to build together. And we want to give a special thanks and gratitude to Unity Church Unitarian in yeah. St. Paul, Minnesota. We could not have done any of this without them. We also want to give a very special and deep gratitude to the Church of the Larger Fellowship. We also could not do any of this without their support and the UUA board. All of that has been integral, so thank you. Let us keep building together towards justice and the administration. Deep gratitude. Thank you. We love you. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. We're not sleeping through this revolution. I want to announce the results of uh, the election. I have the exact numbers, and I'll share them with you. But um, before I do share those, I, I think it's important that this, however this vote will, will go, uh, it doesn't change what our association is doing and will witness for. And I also want to suggest that you withhold celebrating. I think this has been uh, challenging for people on both sides of this issue. I commend both the panel discussion yesterday and um, the relatively respectful uh, discussion today, uh, passions were charged, I know. So I'd ask you to, uh, once I announce the vote, breathe, uh, and then quietly let's do our witness um, in a lot of the work that we have yet to do. Four passing the, general, the uh, business resolution, 
Right. I've been asked to remind you that it takes two-thirds to pass this uh, resolution. I think I've announced that several times, but uh, business resolutions have a high bar to pass. Four, 774 votes, or 54.46 percent. Against, 647, or 45.54 percent against, so the business resolution fails. Thank you for your reaction to that in a polite way. And uh, I urge you to um, breathe and enjoy the rest of the uh, afternoon. And uh, I will adjourn this general session until 8.15 tomorrow morning. Thank you. 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, excuse me.